Okay, dear colleagues, good morning. Uh, I propose that we start. There is a lot of simultaneous meetings ongoing uh, this morning uh, during the last, the last morning of uh, the last day before the Christmas recess. Uh, so we'll have some colleagues who will be walking in and out of the room uh, during the meeting, uh, but, but many will also follow online. So uh, we have interpretation today in German, English, French, Italian, Greek, Spanish, Hungarian, Polish, Slovakian, Slovenian, Bulgarian, and Romanian. And we will have our hearing today on spyware used in third countries and implications for EU foreign relations. Now, third countries and EU foreign relations uh, have covered quite a lot of our agenda this week for, for many reasons. So in that sense, it's, uh, it's quite apt to have this meeting here today. Um, the use of spyware is not limited, as we know, to the use by member states, among others. The mandate of our committee requests us to collect information on the extent to which member states or third countries use uh, intrusive surveillance in a way that violates their rights and freedoms enshrined in the Charter, as well as assess the level of risk this poses to the values enshrined in Article 2 of our treaty, democracy, rule of law, respect for human rights. So our committee is also tasked with investigating whether the use of Pegasus or equivalent spyware by member states authorities has resulted in the transfer of personal data to third countries and particularly but not limited to the NSO group as well as to third countries governments. So together with this first hearing we will organize a second hearing on the geopolitical aspects and will also be informed through a study commissioned by the policy department on Pegasus and equivalent surveillance spyware and its impact on aspects related to the EU's external relations for which we have a presentation foreseen in January. Now, without further ado, I would like to move to uh, the hearing. I'm just quickly checking with our IT desk whether Mr. Uh, ben Jacob is connected online. He is not yet, and I propose we move immediately to Ms. Ilya Siatsitsa, who is the program director and senior legal officer of Privacy International, who is also connected with us remotely. You have the floor for about 10 minutes. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, good morning. Thank you very much for offering me the, opportun the opportunity to give evidence before this committee for another time on behalf of Privacy International, or PI, a London-based non-profit that advocates and researches globally against government and corporate abuses of data and technology. My oh, uh, slide, please. My opening statement will first briefly touch on the EU foreign policy's priorities. I will then focus on the EU roles in transferring surveillance capabilities to third countries. I will there, there outline our concerns and observations regarding those transfers and conclude with key recommendations for, by PI that seek to assist this committee in strengthening the rule of law and upholding, upholding the rights of millions of individuals living in the EU and beyond. Slide, please. Respect for human rights and dignity, as it was already mentions, mentioned, together with the principles of freedom, democracy, equality, and the rule of law, are values common to all European Union countries. They also guide the EU's actions both inside and outside its borders. The European Union's global strategy for foreign and security policy has set out five broad priorities, among which there is a commitment to rules-based global governance. In particular, the EU committed to a global order based on international law, which ensures human rights. The Common Policy commits to systematically mainstreaming human rights and gender issues across policy sectors and institutions, and to champion their indivisibility and universality. Slide, please. This commitment underpins every activity, including the security and defense priorities, where the EU has committed to develop human rights compliant, anti-terrorism cooperation with, among others, North Africa, the Middle East, the Western Balkans, and Turkey. The EU foreign policy plays a key role in supporting the rule of law, democratization, and human rights protection around the world. Yet, we are concerned that certain EU practices seem to undermine the same core rules and values they have committed to promote and champion. Slide, please. Specifically, we are gravely concerned about the activities carried out by the European Commission, as well as, most notably, 
the European Border and Coastal Guard Agency Frontex, the European Union Agency for Law Enforcement Air Training, CEPOL, and the European External Action Service, which relate to the transfer of surveillance capabilities to authorities of non-EU countries. This surveillance support from several EU bodies and institutions includes direct transfer of surveillance equipment to third countries, training of third countries' intelligence and security forces, financing of their operations and procurement, facilitating of exports of surveillance equipment by industry, and promoting legislation which enables surveillance. These transfers include transfers of spyware and hacking capabilities, which can be used not only against human rights defenders, journalists and others, but across borders against people in EU countries as well as EU diplomats. We know this as a result of a long and extensive access to documents process that Privacy International has undertaken since 2019. These documents reveal a far more worrying picture of what the EU institution and its member states contribute to. Slide, please. Slide, please. For example, documentation of a training session provided by the National Police of Spain with EU support to the police, security and intelligence authorities in Bosnia and Herzegovina on financial investigations revealed the promotion of the use of malware and computer trojans. That is software used to have individual devices, to extract data, to take control of functions such as the camera and the microphone, and that is sold on the open market by companies such as NSO Group. The European Union is the world's largest donor of development aid and instrumental support supporter of democracies and peace around the world, and a powerful global force for reining in big tech and other exploitative interests. However, in the past years, they have been using those powers to expand the surveillance capabilities of neighboring countries and beyond. Just to bring two examples. Slide, please. Among others, the EU Trust Fund for Africa, a funding program which uses EU aid money for migration control, has provided the government of Niger with surveillance equipment that includes a cell phone tower, tower simulator used to intercept communication. This is often referred to as an IMSI catcher. catcher. They are highly intrusive devices des designed to imitate mobile phone towers and capable of carrying out indiscriminate monitoring of mobile phones present in a given area. This allows otherwise um, anonymous people to be identified and their locations tracked. Yet, the country has no laws that regulate the use of this kind of intrusive equipment. There seem to be no robust restraints that can prevent authorities from using the equipment for other purposes beyond just for border control purposes. The 11.5 million euro, uh, fund to Niger further included the provision of surveillance drones, surveillance cameras, surveillance software and a wiretapping center. Slide, please. Similarly, in Serbia, security authorities have sought using EU funds to purchase tools used to gather personal data from Facebook, access user passwords, browsing history, content, contacts, locations, history, email, and quote, bypass two-factor authentication, a key security measure which activists and journalists and others rely upon around the world. Slide, please. Last week, the European Ombudsman agreed with our concerns. She issued a decision following a complaint submitted by Privacy International together with five other human rights groups, finding that the European Commission failed to take necessary measures to ensure the protection of human rights in the transfers of technology with potential surveillance capacity that is supported by its multi-billion emergency trust fund for Africa. The Ombudsman's inquiry investigated the support of projects across Africa that aimed at bolstering surveillance and tracking powers 
and involved extensive evidence gatherings from the Commission and the complainants. It found that the Commission was not able to demonstrate that the measures in place ensured a coherent and structured approach for assessing the human rights impacts. The decision recommends that the Commission now require that an assessment of the potential human rights impacts of projects be presented together with corresponding mitigating measures. The lack of such protections, which the Ombudsman called a serious shortcoming, poses a clear risk that these surveillance transfers might cause serious violations of human rights. PI and the Coalition of Human Rights Groups have also filed two more complaints to the European Ombudsman on Frontex and the European External Action Service. The complaints are currently being similarly investigated. Examples like the one above underpin the threats these abuses pose for the rights of EU citizens too, as they can be exploited by third country authorities that lack the stringent safeguards present in the EU legal order. The EU foreign policy plays a key role in supporting the rule of law, democratization and human rights protection around the world. It should take measures to ensure that its current activities do not, do not undermine the same principles they seek to promote. This inquiry will by now be aware that the surveillance market is global and that countries such as China, Israel and the US are all significant exporters and similarly provide financial and technical support to national authorities around the world for surveillance. There is no shortage of surveillance, which means that the work of activists and journalists in countries around the EU's neighborhood will continue to be endangered, undermining democratization efforts and entrenching authoritarianism, the very things the EU stands against and which threaten its own economic and security interests. We strongly believe that this committee's work can be central in ensuring that EU foreign relations are not undermined by swipe, spyware and other surveillance used in third countries. Slide, please. With regard to what the EU should do, there are the following recommendations that we urge you to adopt. First, the export and transfer transfer of certain surveillance technologies should be prohibited due to their highly intrusive nature and the unique threats they pose to privacy and security. Among others, hacking cap capabilities sold by spyware companies such as the NSO Group have the potential to be far more intrusive than any other surveillance technique by permitting the government to remotely and in secret access personal devices and all the intimate information they store. As such, it is difficult to foresee a circumstance where their use would meet the standards and requirements set under international human rights law. Second, transfer of surveillance should be made conditional to an appropriate legal framework and effective safeguards, including independent authorization and oversight procedures, as well as appropriate remedial mechanisms. Furthermore, Support of surveillance technology should only be provided to countries with the adequate level of data protection frameworks. Third, any transfer of surveillance capabilities should be provided only after adequate human rights impact and risk assessments are carried out. For, finally, it is key to provide the European Parliament greater capabilities of scrutiny and ensuring accountability over EU funds. Slide, please. In sum, PI believes that this committee is presented with a unique opportunity to uphold the fundamental rights of millions of people, while in doing so also promote the EU's own interests. We are confident that it will live up to its challenging task and promote democracies where people are free to be human, both offline and online. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Yatitsa. Uh, I'll, I'll check again whether Mr. Um, uh, ben Jacob is connected. No, not, not yet. Then we move to our, uh, our third guest, Mr. Guillaume Giraud, uh, who is an expert in surveillance technologies uh, and a former agent of the French intelligence services. And you recently published a book where you discussed the, the use 
of spyware such as Pegasus. So it will be very interesting to, to listen to your contribution. You also have about 10 minutes. Bonjour, merci. Euh, ingénieur de formation, je suis concepteur depuis 25 ans de systèmes stratégiques de surveillance et de contre-surveillance. D'abord employé d'un service de renseignement du ministère de l'Intérieur français, j'ai ensuite évolué dans le privé pour des sociétés françaises du secteur, puis en tant que consultant indépendant, apportant mes conseils à divers gouvernements d'Afrique et du Moyen-Orient. Afin que vous puissiez pleinement évaluer mes prises de position, je précise que j'ai fondé à mon retour en France en 2021 une société spécialisée dans la fourniture de techniques spéciales d'enquête à l'administration française et qu'à ce titre, je serai très probablement prochainement candidat à la fourniture de logiciels espions que le droit français nomme logiciels de captation et qui sont strictement encadrés par le droit français dans les articles 706-102 du Code de procédure pénale et L853-1 du Code de sécurité intérieure. Et j'aimerais également préciser que si l'administration française utilise des logiciels espions, c'est que le législateur a reconnu leur nécessité dans certaines situations Essentiellement, euh, quand euh, la gravité des crimes et des infractions poursuivies euh, l'exige et quand euh, les cibles des surveillances utilisent des moyens de communication chiffrants. Par exemple, toutes les applications euh, que nous connaissons très bien, WhatsApp, Telegram, Signal, euh, qui nécessitent que les conversations soient interceptées euh, dans le terminal de la cible et non pas dans le réseau puisqu'elles y sont euh, illisibles. Entre 2015 et 2021, euh, j'ai été chargé d'assurer la sécurité des communications électroniques de la famille royale d'un état du Golfe Persique. A ce titre, j'ai déployé un centre technique doté de capacités de chiffrement et j'ai régulièrement été consulté sur des sujets sensibles de ma compétence. Vu le contexte actuel, je précise qu'il ne s'agissait pas du Qatar. Comme je l'ai écrit dans un livre publié en septembre de cette année, j'ai indirectement été démarché par la société NSO qui édite le logiciel Pegasus. Bien que les interceptions de communication, alors prérogatives du ministère de l'Intérieur dans cet état, fussent explicitement exclues de mon mandat pour l'autorité locale, j'ai reçu la visite sur mon lieu de travail un jour de l'été 2016 d'un conseiller proche du chef de l'État qui m'a enjoint de contacter le dirigeant de la société NSO pour permettre à son donneur d'ordre de se doter du logiciel Pegasus. Mon interlocuteur était extatique à cette idée. Je le cite « Ce logiciel permet d'écouter tout le monde, nos ennemis comme nos amis. Tous les dirigeants du Golfe le veulent. » On me demandait donc clairement de me mettre directement en relation avec NSO sans impliquer les institutions du pays et de me positionner en maître d'œuvre pour l'activation d'un dispositif de surveillance sans contrainte par le logiciel Pegasus au profit exclusif de la famille royale en dehors de toute procédure de contrôle de l'État. Quelques heures plus tard, après analyse complète de la situation, je refusais catégoriquement la mission qui m'était proposée et je rendais un avis négatif assorti d'un avertissement au donneur d'ordre. Et pourtant, si j'avais été mu par l'appât du gain, j'aurais accepté sans hésiter, puisque j'étais ainsi placé de manière providentielle comme un fournisseur intermédiaire sur un marché d'une valeur sans doute supérieure à 10 millions d'euros. Alors que je mesure aujourd'hui les conséquences de ma décision, je constate que ce refus m'a en réalité infiniment plus enrichi. J'ai en effet compris que l'on pouvait mal faire le métier que j'avais choisi et que ce jour-là, on m'avait donné la possibilité de décider délibérément de bien le faire. Depuis cette date, je n'ai de cesse d'alerter sur les dangers d'une surveillance non régulée et je suis fier de témoigner devant vous aujourd'hui la conscience légère 
et de mettre mes compétences et mon expérience au service d'une conception raisonnée de la surveillance. Début novembre de cette année, euh, j'ai lu votre rapport intérimaire et les convergences entre les constats réalisés dans plusieurs pays de l'Union européenne par les membres de la Commission et ma propre expérience m'ont choqué. En effet, alors que je ne m'y attendais absolument pas, j'ai retrouvé cette description de la tentation de puissants de contourner les règles de leurs États de faire tomber les garde-fous protégeant leurs concitoyens pour concentrer entre leurs mains un pouvoir accru. Si l'on prend un peu de hauteur et si l'on observe ce qui se fait à travers le monde sur le sujet, on ne peut que constater que les logiciels espions prolifèrent et que leur liberté d'utilisation est totale. De l'application quasi gratuite qui permet de surveiller illégalement, rappelons-le, les déplacements de son compagnon, au logiciel de classe internationale zéro day et zéro clic comme les Pegasus, il se décline en une large gamme à destination de tout public. Mais il partage une caractéristique commune. Il ne souffre d'aucune entrave, aucune règle qui permettrait une limitation ou même un contrôle de leur action. Et si nous devons réfléchir à la mise en œuvre de dispositifs pour encadrer l'utilisation de ces logiciels, c'est bien cela que nous devons avoir en tête. Il faut briser la croyance, très largement répandue auprès des décideurs de tous les niveaux, que l'utilisation de ces logiciels est totalement libre. Euh, après étude, je suis parvenu à une liste provisoire de mesures que je, que je mets à, à, la, à, la, à la discussion aujourd'hui et, et à l'avenir. Euh, il faudrait, je pense, premièrement définir clairement le périmètre fonctionnel des logiciels espions utilisables par les administrations des États membres dans leur exercice légitime de protection de la population. Il convient de rappeler en effet que les États membres utilisent des logiciels espions qui rendent de grands services, comme je l'ai précisé au début de mon exposé, dans la traque de terroristes et d'organisations criminelles. Et mon propos n'est absolument pas de m'y opposer. Mais les institutions européennes doivent se positionner en leader de la régulation sur le sujet. Ceux qui ne se conformeraient pas à leurs règles s'excluraient du marché européen et dans une certaine mesure de l'état de l'art en connaissance de cause. Une piste de réflexion pourrait par exemple être de limiter les fichiers recueillis par les logiciels espions à ceux dont la date de création est postérieure à la décision de surveillance prise par un juge. En effet, j'ai noté que ce point retenait l'attention de nombreux membres de la commission PEGA et cela me paraît sensé. Deuxièmement, en complément de la première mesure, euh, il conviendrait de mettre en place un dispositif d'homologation de conformité des logiciels espions élaborés au sein de l'Union européenne. Dans de nombreux États membres, une procédure locale de conformité existe et il s'agirait donc d'harmoniser toutes ces règles puis d'assurer la maintenance d'un registre central. Et troisièmement, il faudrait, je pense, aussi contraindre tous les services d'enquête à apposer un marquage logiciel à chacune des infections par logiciel espion. Un marquage qui pourrait être composé des références d'homologation petit a du logiciel, petit b de l'enquête et petit c de la cible. Ainsi, quand on découvrirait une infection sur un téléphone, on saurait exactement d'où elle vient et qui elle concerne dans le cadre de quelle enquête. Et les, logiciels qui les infections qui n'auraient pas de marquage pourraient être déclarées hors la loi. En complément de, de, ce, de, de, de ces dispositifs qui nécessiteraient, je pense, de constituer un centre d'excellence au niveau européen, euh, il pourrait être judicieux de proposer aux États membres une assistance euh, afin qu'ils soient souverains dans la création et l'utilisation de ces dispositifs. Cela pourrait euh, constituer une contrepartie aux contraintes qui leur sont euh, imposées. Et enfin, 
C'est un point qui n'est pas connecté à tous les autres que j'ai mentionnés auparavant, et je ne suis pas expert en la matière, mais j'ai noté que euh, les vulnérabilités de sécurité dans les, opérateurs, dans les réseaux des opérateurs de télécommunications euh, sont une faille euh, très importante exploitée par les euh, concepteurs de logiciels espions. Et il faudrait donc, je pense, contraindre les opérateurs de communication électronique des États membres à mettre à niveau la sécurité de leur réseau, euh, et, et, et enfin de, euh, afin de ne pas trop faciliter euh, les infections, euh, les piratages par euh, les sociétés euh, éditrices de logiciels qui ne se conformeraient pas aux règles de l'Union européenne. Voilà, je vous remercie de votre attention. Merci bien, M. Biro. Um, uh, thank you very much. I think that's very interesting. Also, uh, thanks for keeping such a, a close eye on the work of our committee uh, and yes. refle reflecting on, the, on some of the comments that, that have been made already. It's, I think it's very, very helpful and we appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Ben Jacob has connected by now, so I immediately pass the floor also for 10 minutes to Omar Ben Jacob, who is a cyber and disinformation reporter from Hades newspaper. And among others, he recently published an article about the export of surveillance software from Cyprus and Greece to Sudan. So you have the floor for 10 minutes. And could I also ask the colleagues who would like to take part in the Q&A session uh, after the speaker uh, to indicate their, uh, their wish to do so. Thank you. So thank you so much for having me here today. It's, uh, it's a real honor to address this committee. Um, uh, I want to kind of offer a bit of context uh, based on my experience reporting about this field from for the past year and then kind of end into talking about uh, the investigation that was published a few weeks ago together with journalists uh, from Greece uh, and the lighthouse in the Netherlands. Um, so I think in the year and a half that has passed since the Project Pegasus investigation kind of uh, exploded and uh, we all became acutely aware of uh, uh, of this industry and the way it's used. I think we've learned a lot, or I've also learned a lot. Um, and, and I want to kind of share some of that context because I think it's actually very, very important as, as you move forward, uh, trying to put forward a European policy on this issue. Um, so I think one important thing that we learned is that a lot of this stuff was legal uh, and that a lot of the use of NSO in itself was not only regulated, but actually quite strictly regulated. Uh, at least by the state of Israel, so it, it, we'll call it at the selling side. Um, I think what we've learned is that the, the use on the receiving side uh, is also legal in many cases. Um, and I think the third thing we've learned is that this ecosystem or that this functions within a much broader ecosystem of, um, of we can say, diplomacy and also technology and communication because uh, I think, uh, though we might all feel uh, personally, or, or I think we might all have different opinions about how the use of uh, such spyware is done in Europe, uh, and whether we want that to be legal or not, I think there is a wider question, which is, uh, how does this market look when it's completely unregulated, and how it looks when it uh, is regulated? And maybe we don't feel comfortable with use of this for example, in Spain, for what we perceive as political purposes, but it is a legal use. And I think, from my perspective, from looking at this past year and a half, I do not think that banning spyware is a realistic option. I think the only option uh, is regulation. And, and, and the point I'm going to try to convey to you is that I think that, unlike what we kind of assume, that this is some completely new issue, the cyber is some mystery. It's not a mystery. It's an arms sales. The Western world has almost 100 years of experience, if not more, regulating arms sales. Uh, we're quite good at it. Um, and I think this is the kind of thinking we should be bringing to this. And I think that the discussion about sales to other countries vis-a-vis -vis the EU is a great way to understand that. So... Uh technology... We're trying to, his connection is unstable, okay. We'll, we'll try once to refresh, and if not, we... Uh... I'm back, sorry. Yes, great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Van Jacob. He was just long enough, back long enough to say I'm back. We'll try to refresh once more.
Hi, Beth. Can you hear me all? Yes, we can hear you. I'll try to be short. I think. I, the story here, or uh, the, my big takeaway, the broad perspective, is that this is a story of privatization. Uh, we're seeing skills, technologies, abilities that used to belong only to states uh, entering the private market. Um, on the other hand, we're also seeing that as they enter the private market, states and entities who did not have the ability to develop these technologies independently, independently are the biggest clients. And I think that is a very, very, very important point to understand as we as we move forward in terms of our discussion about policy and regulation, because we know that there are countries who know how to do this, and we know there are countries who don't want to do know how to do this, and we know there are countries who want to buy this technology. And uh, I don't think that dynamic is solvable. I think what is solvable is regulating uh, the dynamics between these countries and also uh, creating some legal framework or some even uh, diplomatic framework in which countries that don't have internal legal frameworks to deal with this stuff can because um, it's not just about this or that specific spyware. Um, these these technologies are sold in bundles uh, and as, as I like to say, NSO only has the bad luck of leaving forensics. Um, there are many other softwares, many other programs, many other services uh, that we may or may not be conscious of them. And uh, I think, therefore, we need to be very careful in terms of focusing too much on one specific tech, too much on one specific, you know, like uh, what cyber people call attack vectors. So, for example, it's very popular now to think about uh, banning zero days or zero clicks uh, within this space. And I think that it's, it's an idea that has merit, but I think the, 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 the broader issue is that we need to, to make sure that these kind of arms, when they reach countries, uh, either they don't reach countries that don't have any legal framework uh, to, to, to deal with them, or when they do, then uh, at, at the seller's end, there is some due diligence and some accountability. Um, I, I think the Israeli model of the way these co companies are governed or oversight is not, necessarily, is, is not necessarily a good one, but it does involve some from what we're seeing in the past six months, it seems that Israeli oversight is in many senses much more strict um, and much more uh, mature than uh, certain aspects of the EU policy just because it's lagging behind. And uh, a lot of the work that uh, a lot of journalists have been doing on uh, the company generically known as Intellexa has to do exactly with the fact that, that though they, 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 from our perspective, seem exactly like NSO, the moment they function from countries like uh, Greece or Cyprus, then the regulation governing them seems to be very different. Um, uh, generally, though Israel has been kind of portrayed as like the mothership bad guy of the story, I, I think this is actually I, I, one of the ironic points is that Israel is actually proving itself to be quite good at regulating this technology. A lot of what we're seeing in Greece and uh, Cyprus has to do with companies that want to avoid Israeli oversight and seem to believe that European oversight is much simpler to, to circumnavigate or at least easier to play with. Um, the history of Israeli spyware and exports does pass through Cyprus. So a lot of these companies were set up there for, uh, for let's call it um, uh, regulation like circumnavigation. Uh, that being said, I do think uh, it's clear that it, it, the Israeli model that requires these companies to, to provide an end-user certificate with very specific rules, this end-user certificate may not be uh, in line with legal, not, not, it might not only be legal or not legal. Uh, I think what's sad about Israel is that this past year and a half has taught us that they just didn't want to regulate the field that much. So they, now they want to because now we're all in trouble. They're like, it's bad PR. But until this moment, no one wanted to overly uh, uh, regulate the field. But now it is quite strictly regulated from what I'm understanding. And I think what we're seeing is the rise of these kind of uh, unregulated or quasi-regulated companies. Uh, one one more comment that I think is very important. Um, uh, Intellexa and firms like Intellexa, what makes them unique when they when they move out of regulations, they, they can do something that uh, Israeli firms cannot, which is provide a bundle of services. So according to Israeli export law, NSO and companies like NSO who sell offensive cyber cannot sell a service. They can't teach you how to hack. They can sell you a technology that can hack, but they can't teach you how to do it. What we're seeing now is service companies this service thing, this this technology plus service is a different scale of an issue, and I think that, in a sense, is much harder to regulate. But uh, just to circle back to kind of uh, the broader point, I think that, that, that regulation and regulation that is that borrows its logic from the world of international arms sales is 
the only solution. Uh, I think stigmatization of these tools uh, within a diplomatic framework is uh, is, is is also key. Um, and but I think the past year and a half has taught us that you can regulate it. The moment Israel understood that it's bad public publicity or bad diplomacy for them to sell this to Africa, it's not being sold in Africa anymore. And I think the question now becomes how the EU becomes kind of the the, the leader in terms of 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 of, of, uh, of, of creating the framework for this regulation. Uh, which is very important because I think if we ban it, if this is banned, it will only become more illegal. Uh, we're already seeing, alongside firms like Intellexa, smaller smaller suppliers who are selling exploits or just selling the technology, like the the, the 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 exploits behind the technology. Um, and I think that uh, it's very important that we don't go, uh, we, that we don't push the field. Uh, so hard that it goes completely underground because we don't even we can't even imagine how on how bad this looks underground like a year and a half ago nso was we thought was like the most evil thing we could imagine it's quite the opposite they're a completely legal and regulated company and we should strive that all these companies be as regulated as nso so maybe we prefer that they have officials that will take different business decisions but at the core of everything they did it was legal and they had paperwork for it even with spain even with what happened in Africa, yeah, and in that sense, the, the, the thinking about regulation needs to needs to be, uh, I think, much more focused on the end users, the countries getting it, uh, and the, the process in which it happens. So that's my kind of broad, big picture statement based on this past year and a half. I really, really am honored to have had the chance to talk to you. I've met some of you when you were here in Israel, and I'm here if you have any questions. Thank you very much, and I can assure you that there will be questions. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll take the questions one by one from our members, um, and then you get the, the opportunity to reply, uh, all three of you, to the questions. Uh, so first we go to our rapporteur, Sophie Edefeld. Yes, thank you, Chair, and uh, I apologize to the first uh, two speakers for being late, but uh, I had to be in another, in a, in, a, in a trilogue, and I have still not mastered the... Uh, the art of uh, omnipresence. I'm practicing, uh, well, but uh, <laughs> I know I'm very, I'm very limited. Um, my questions to uh, Mr. Giro, a little bit uh, at, at, at random. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the issue of exports because we've been looking a lot at Cyprus, Bulgaria, uh, Israel as uh, hubs for exports. Um, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about France. You have seen the recent publication, I imagine, in Politico about Mr. Leandri with his new, um, uh, with his new business uh, alternative, and he seems to be operating as a kind of broker. Is, is that, that your impression as well? Because apparently he is, uh, he is also offering predator. This is what I hear. Uh, what is your impression uh, of how the export rules are being applied uh, in France today. We know that in the past there have been issues, there are court cases against uh, Amesis, etc. Um, but uh, is it your, I mean, how does that work? Because if he is going to, if Leandri thinks that he can sell Predator and, and other products and services, then apparently he thinks that, the, that he can do that under the the current uh, export regime. And I would like to hear a little bit more about that. Then. You said something about marquage. I was trying to understand exactly what you meant. Does that mean that you think secret services should have a kind of, let's say, a kind of signature, a kind of uh, label, so that when there's an infection, we know that it's from a particular secret service? Okay, I see you nodding, so that... Uh, that <laughs> okay. Uh, I'd like to hear your views on um, the regulation of trade in, uh, in vulnerabilities. Um, and then to Mr. Ben Jacob, but maybe also to Mr. Giro, if he cares to uh, to answer, because we, uh, you, Mr. Ben Jacob, you say that the is by now the Israeli export license regime is more strict or applied more strictly in any case uh, than in the European Union. That is probably right. Uh, do you expect that to change under the new government? Um, how does this relate to the story that Celebrite uh, is still being used in Russia, apparently? This is, oh, okay, I'm asking the right question. Okay, I, I, you can, uh, I'll leave you to answer that. Uh, and two final questions. 
Uh, of course, neither Israel nor NSO will confirm which two countries have been struck off the list of 14 EU member states, but everybody assumes it was Poland and Hungary. Uh, do we have any more tangible indications for that? And finally, what are your expectations of the, uh, the new cooperation between, uh, or the new initiative of Mr. Julio and Mr. Kurz? What do you expect? Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. I was trying to lip read what Mr. Ben Jacob was, uh, was trying to tell us, but you, you'll get the floor in a minute. First, uh, to take the, the answers in the order of the questions, Mr. Giraud. Euh, oui, merci pour vos questions. Euh, alors, le, le cas d'alternative est bien spécifique parce que la personnalité de M. Léandry est très controversée euh, et je, ne, je pense qu'il n'est pas du tout représentatif hein, du, du tissu euh, industriel français. Et euh, ça me fait de la peine de le dire, mais euh, M. Léandry est en quelque sorte un, un symptôme euh, des relations abusives qu'il peut y avoir entre les industriels et le politique en France. Euh, voilà, j'en dirai pas plus. Euh, à propos de la régulation sur ce sujet, euh, je sais qu'il y a eu des changements l'année dernière et que la commission des biens à double usage, hein, qui est euh, compétente en France pour décider euh, de la légalité de l'export, de, de, ces, de ces logiciels. Je sais que sa compétence a été renforcée avec, euh, il, il me semble, euh, une, euh, il faut maintenant que, que les services du Premier ministre euh, donnent leur accord final avant euh, l'export, ce qui n'était pas le cas auparavant. Et donc, euh, j'ai envie de dire que que l'administration est, est plus présente dans le processus maintenant, alors que c'était le politique. Euh, vous citez le cas Amésis euh, en Libye. Euh, J'ai été employé d'Amésis et je suis allé en Libye, donc je connais bien le dossier. Euh, J'ai été auditionné hein, par euh, l'Office central de lutte euh, des, de crimes contre l'humanité en tant que témoin. et Il y aura le procès en février en France et tout le monde en attend des résultats. Euh, sur la question plus technique que vous posez de la signature, oui, c'est bien ça. Euh, ce que j'imagine, ce ce hein, c'est mon cerveau d'ingénieur qui, euh, qui imagine ça et que je mets à votre disposition. Euh, il faudrait effectivement que euh, chaque service ait une signature unique, euh, que chaque enquête ait une signature unique et que chaque cible ait une signature unique et que la combinaison des trois forme un saut que l'on appose dans le code du logiciel, qui bien évidemment ne, ne figurerait pas en clair, mais dont vous auriez la clé. Et ainsi, vous pourriez connaître quand euh, un citoyen euh, vient vous saisir ou vient saisir un service opérationnel, euh, savoir d'où vient, vient le coût en quelque sorte. C'est exactement cela que je propose. C'est la conclusion de ma réflexion sur le sujet. Et sur la question de la régulation des vulnérabilités, J'en sais très peu sur le sujet. Euh, tout ce que je peux vous dire, c'est que euh, c'est le sujet central. Hein, quand on parle de logiciels espions, bien sûr, euh, tous ces hackers qui euh, réfléchissent et qui trouvent des vulnérabilités, qui les monnaient à prix fort et qui les vendent soit sur le marché noir, soit parce qu'ils ont des contrats directs avec les fournisseurs. Euh, il y a effectivement une cascade d'intervenants pour la fourniture de logiciels espions et ces hackers qui, qui, qui trouvent les vulnérabilités sont le premier maillon. Euh, et euh, je, je, pour, ils sont écrantés en quelque sorte, ils sont masqués, pour moi je, je ne les connais pas donc, et je, sais, je ne sais absolument pas comment est, est régulé euh, ce, ce secteur mais c'est une bonne question euh, que, vous, que vous posez. Voilà. Thank you very much. And then we move to Mr. Ben Jacob. Uh, so, just uh, the first question had to do with uh, why I think the Israeli oversight is better at this point and if it will change. And the second question was about uh, Celebrite, right? Yes. Sophie? Yes. Well, okay. yes. So, I think the Israeli oversight, the reason it's working so well right now is because there's uh, because there was such a big backlash, specifically vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Um, I think what's interesting about this backlash is that it really shows how uh, a market can function, it, can show, it shows the good and the bad of this dynamic uh, and this change that is now going to happen and I believe that Netanyahu will will change. I don't know if it's going to be back to what we were, was in the past, but I think it's safe to assume that a different government will mean a different policy in this context. Um, I think what's interesting is to look at certain companies uh, and this kind of strict regulation did, did them very bad. Companies that are built only from selling 
uh, to, let's say, kind of uh, non-democratic regimes and were used to this kind of bonanza that Israel was facilitating are having a very hard time to hold on. But a lot of companies are not. Like, the market, it really changed the market. And I think there are a lot of few companies, mostly the market leaders, that's also something we should say, like it's mostly like the two, three big companies, that are managing to kind of, you know, craft a, a, a way forward in this dynamic. So I don't know from the Israeli defense establishment if this was a success. I think they don't think it was, because I think some companies did shut down, more companies than they wanted to. But in theory, I can mention, you know, a company like Paragon, which is which has never been directly accused of any wrongdoing. And Paragon is a company that doesn't seem to have had a bad year. So NSO had a bad year. Kandiro had a bad year. Um, and, uh, and, and other firms also. But, but also, you know, I think Paragon had a good year because they never, like, they're built on being very close to the defense establishment. Um, and they're generally... Uh, focused only on five eyes in Western states, and, 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 and it works. I think it's not enough to support an entire ecosystem like Israel used to have, uh, but it's also very important to understand what we're actually regulating. This is a great way to get into Celebrite, because firms like Celebrite are not even, or at least very recently, weren't even considered cyber firms. Like Celebrite sells a hardware device that allows police forces to use, like to, to, to empty a device, uh, or as someone told me once, cliffhanger from Mr. Ben Jakob. Um, maybe we, we give the floor to uh, uh, Mr. Ben Jakob is back. Yeah, sorry. I'll, I'm sorry. I'll finish up. I was cut off. Um, I, the, uh, I, I think the, the point is, and this is a very, very kind of nuanced and important point, is that regulation works. It just you need to incentivize the companies and you need to incentivize the countries, and it has to work in this full ecosystem. So countries need incentivized to, to regulate its sales. Countries need uh, incentives to regulate the, when they receive it, the end user agreement. Um, uh, but we should not be thinking of something else. Last question about uh, Kurtz and Shalev Julio's company Dream. I don't know that much about this. I think they're actually a defensive company, but I really, really, really don't know the answer. It makes sense to be their defensive company because there's more money in defensive cyber than offensive cyber, unlike what people think, like as a market generally, the defensive field is bigger. And Shalev Julio plus Kurtz sounds to me mostly like a defensive company that is targeting uh, state contracts like they want to do defense of big like water infrastructures, it makes sense that they could both use their branding to do this. And I can't clearly see how this could support some like evil spyware operation, uh, just because we know they don't need that to do that. So like besides the fact that it's two like scary, sexy names, I don't think this is actually something that uh, dangerous. I think it's a, a defensive cyber company that wants to bank on the names of its two founders to bring really big contracts from states that are really scared when they hear the word cyber and don't really know what that means. That is a, that is a very good summary. <laughs> Thank you so much. And then, um, Ms. Siatitsa, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll uh, just follow up on a couple of points that were raised. And uh, in particular, I would uh, be um, in on the side of agreeing that uh, hacking capabilities and hacking powers are quite extensive and they go beyond the, the uh, surveillance industry that sells them. There are certain countries that they're capable of conducting hacking um, without the need of any uh, of buying any equipment. Um, but however, uh, and so regulating hacking powers is key answer um, to uh, the whole issue going beyond uh, regulating a specific uh, industry that it's selling those powers. Uh, having said that, I would like though to caution the committee to uh, distinguishing which uh, regulation works. Um, first of all, with regard to experts regulation, um, unless there is full transparency of who is selling to whom and specific enforcement agencies that they are receiving this capability, uh, we cannot really be talking about um, appropriate regulation. And also legality uh, should not only be assessed with regard to um, 
whether the export paperwork has been filed, but also with regard to the legal framework that regulates the use of those powers. And uh, this is scarce at the moment, not only the EU, but across the world. Um, it's uh, about regulation and about the capability also to conduct oversight with regard to how has access to those powers, when this to, against whom those powers have been used, being capable of having an appropriate remedial mechanism and being able to notify people with regard to when they've been targeted. Um, I mean, these are only, I'm only scratching the surface at the moment, um, uh, but uh, in that regard, uh, Privacy International as well has been proposing a set of safeguards, uh, hacking, necessary hacking safeguards that should be in place uh, whenever a government decides that they should be using hacking powers. And the one last thing I wanted just to keep put uh, in the mind is part of um, a state's obligations includes as well uh, the obligation to ensure um, security of uh, digital security of communications. And the question back is to what extent exploiting vulnerabilities of devices instead of trying to patch them and correct them doesn't undermine this obligation to ensure um, the digital security of communications. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, then, Ms. Novak. Usam trim poročevalcem, usam trim poročevalcem se zahvaljujem za zanimiva poročila. Toda, ko poslušamo vse to, Mislim, da je naša demokracija kar veliki miri ogrožena. Nekatere stvari lahko spremenimo in izboljšamo, na nekatere pa ne moremo vplivati. Naprimer, v prvi predstavitvi je bilo povedano, da Evropska unija prodaja to vohunsko opremo nekaterim državam, ki sploh nimajo regulacije, in tudi sama se strinjam, da bi morali pogojevati prodajo, usposabljanje denar, prav s tem, da te države spoštujejo regulacijo. Po drugi strani pa gledam, da tudi v Evropski uniji tega nimamo dobro urejenega in bi vprašala, ali lahko navedete, katere države, ki so pri tem bolj napredne, ali so tudi države Evropske unije, ki sploh nimajo te regulacije in ali menite, da bi morala biti močna evropska regulacija, kajti ne vem, če so vse države zainteresirane za to, da v svoji državi uvedejo močnejšo regulacijo, še posebej tiste, ki nimajo najboljših namenov. Tako mislim, da v Evropski uniji imamo veliko manj pomembnih stvari, strogo reguliranih, zato mislim, da bi morali to področje, ki nas ogroža, še bolje regulirati. Thank you, Ms. Novak, for all three of the panelists to answer, but maybe we'll do the reverse order and start with Ms. Jatica. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your question, because it's exactly to the point and what we have been advocating since early on, that a regulation of hacking powers, uh, it's not a solution uh, that comes, it, it requires a broader and multi-pronged approach to regulation. Uh, it, it's not, uh, it requires to um, uh, regulate exports better and stricter and imports in that regard. It requires also to uh, introducing a robust surveillance um, powers regulation framework specific to hacking powers if these powers are used. Uh, most of the countries are at the moment do not have a framework that regula regulates equipment interference specifically. They usually would just cover it under existing surveillance 
uh, frameworks and that as such is not sufficient uh, to regulate those powers because of their unique and intrusive nature as well. Um, and uh, then it could also require um, clear procurement procedures and finally it would require um, a judicial system that is equipped with uh, being capable of assessing uh, those, uh, those, the usage of such powers and also to be able to correct them and rem remedy the victims uh, when there are such. And then also, as I mentioned um, in my in, uh, intervention, uh, reg regulation needs to come also from the most unlikely places, and some of these hacking capabilities are right now um, facilitated by, for instance, EU aid money. And so having stronger uh, regulation in uh, the way um, EU aid um, assistance is provided, especially when it includes enhancing surveillance capabilities, would be um, absolutely necessary. Uh, whether that can come as a EU across regulation, I think uh, with uh, the list of the different uh, regulatory frameworks that needs to be updated, um, I think uh, <laughs> you can guess my answers. It wouldn't be something that it's at the moment um, necessarily feasible and it will have to come, come in the form of recommendation and directive at the beginning at least from different angles. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ben Jacob. I think what happened uh, with Spain really shows that uh, when countries find themselves on, on both sides of a certain story, um, then this issue that I think uh, was just raised, but I think is very smart, this issue of this also being an imports issue, which I fully, fully agree with because someone, someone is selling it, but someone is buying it, um, I think it really raises interesting questions about how we expect and how we'd want these things to be regulated. Because I think what's so intriguing for me is from a civilian perspective about Spain is that like they were simultaneously like, yeah, this is completely legal when you do this internally for political whatever purposes, but when you do it to us for military purposes or diplomacy purposes, it's not legitimate. And I think that's very telling. I think it's very interesting because that same problem plays out within countries, right? So imagine the difference between using these technologies to collect intelligence for quote unquote, a ticking time bomb, as opposed to collecting a, a, a evidence that you want to present in court. And I think that a lot of my thinking about countries that have regulatory frameworks have already addressed these questions. Um, it, 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 I think that's a very important point to take into account, so to, to, to understand the different kind of uses that this could have. And I think that when you think about, for example, uh, technology that is dangerous for democratic processes, uh, my assumption is that the next year is going to be focused less and less on offensive cyber and more and more on firms that provide what you could generally call open source intelligence, um, social media analysis, and this kind of stuff, which are which seem to us very kind of like banal and benign right now. But I, I have a feeling that we will soon discover that they can be also used for mass surveillance. Um, and this idea of surveillance using social media is to me as big of an issue as the spyware. And I think that until we perceive that they are all sold together, for example, within Intellexa, they are all sold as one bundle. Yeah, the technical interception of hacking someone's phone is sold together with open source kind of mass media, mass uh, kind of, it's not mass surveillance, but it's like social media driven surveillance through avatars and this kind of stuff are happening together. And the reason you need them to happen together and for example, we never thought about this during NSO, uh, is that how do I find someone's number? How do I know in a certain protest movement, who do I want to target with Pegasus, right? We have this assumption that everyone knows everyone, but it's not. And so for example, if you want to map a protest movement, you need technologies that is not even really regulated. And this leads back to Sophie's question to me about Celebrite. So Celebrite wasn't under regulation until very recently because what they were doing was not perceived to be uh, offensive cyber for military clients. It was perceived to be civilian technology, dual use technology for police clients. But what we discovered that a police client can also be an investigative force in Russia um, that 
I'm sure is doing everything legally within the Russian framework, yes. I'm sure every, every, everything they do, even in retrospect, they can get paperwork to prove that it's legal. But I think the, the, the point is different. So it's that, that this was sold, quote unquote, legally to a civilian factor. Then regulation changed in 2020, and Israel now considers this company to be part of its regulation, but the technology is still there. And this kill switch, remote kill switch, it, it's unclear if it works or if you, maybe you can just hack the technology. So this, this kind of uh, trickling down of technologies is also something that we're seeing, and we have to take that into account, right? We're seeing that, uh, that you know, firms like, uh, like Beltrox in, the, in India will offer services that are like a hacked version of Pegasus, right? So, so I think in that sense, like the, 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 the broader ecosystem um, is really, really, really important when you, and, and, and breaking down what you actually want to regulate and how, like sales of exploits, who are the clients, Intel versus evidence collection. These are all really, really important questions that we have to kind of like break down and, and, and be able to actually address this. That was my, my take on that. Thank you, Mr. Giraud. Uh, uh, oui, j'ai noté plusieurs points uh, uh, très intéressants. P premièrement, sur, sur la question de la possible régulation de, de la recherche de vulnérabilité par des pirates, hein, uh, ceux qui sont à l'origine des failles uh, zero day, de, de la découverte de failles zero day. Euh, c est, c est, on touche là un, un, un point quasiment euh, schizophrène de, de notre approche euh, parce que euh, moi, en tant que spécialiste de l'enquête et de la sécurité, euh, je considère que euh, les logiciels espions euh, sont nécessaires et je considère donc que euh, les pirates qui euh, nous euh, fournissent des failles zéro day sont nécessaires. Donc, je considère qu'il est nécessaire que, dans certains cas de figure, euh, des citoyens euh, soient piratés. Mais si vous parlez à un spécialiste de cybersécurité, qui n'est pas forcément très éloigné de mon métier, euh, lui va considérer qu'il faut à tout prix protéger tous les citoyens euh, des attaques de ce type, alors que, que nous sommes quasiment collègues. Euh, donc, c'est un, un point qui est très difficile à trancher, et d'autant plus que si... Si l'on décide que, que tout cela euh, doit être considéré comme, comme illégal, hein, je, je dis ça juste pour, pour, le, pour le raisonnement, euh, ça, ça, ça revient implicitement à mettre nos capacités d'enquête dans les mains des GAFAM, euh, puisque euh, c'est reconnaître que euh, seules les sociétés éditrices euh, des systèmes d'exploitation des téléphones, que sont Apple et Google, sont légitimes à, 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 à rentrer dans ces systèmes d'exploitation sans utiliser de piratage. Euh, et, et ça, c'est une, une menace euh, sur la souveraineté européenne. Euh, D'ailleurs, je, euh, je vous invite à, à, à suivre les activités du, du TAG hein, de Google, le Threat Assessment Group de Google, qui publie euh, des, 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 des failles de vulnérabilité euh, qui sont exploitées par les, par, les, euh, par les éditeurs de logiciels espions. Et pour ma part, j'ai noté que depuis... Euh, depuis un an et demi, le TAG concentre exclusivement son attention sur des sociétés européennes, alors qu'avant, il se concentrait sur, des, sur son attention sur des sociétés non européennes. Donc je, euh, soyons attentifs également aux, aux tentatives d'ingérence que, que, que nos travaux peuvent susciter outre-Atlantique. Ça, c'est sur la question de la régulation du hacking. Euh, sur la question de la réglementation européenne au sens large, euh, je pense qu'il y a effectivement des pays qui sont en mesure d'apporter des éléments pour que l'Union européenne établisse l'état de l'art sur le sujet. Et je pense aussi qu'il y a des pays qui ne souhaitent pas appliquer ces mesures et d'autres qui sont demandeurs. Vous avez, vous avez, je pense qu'il y, y a de tout et, et, et l'Union européenne serait vraiment là dans un rôle d'harmonisation et de collecte de, de ces règles d'état de l'art pour, pour les mettre à disposition de tous et éventuellement de, de les contraindre. Euh, enfin, il y a eu plusieurs euh, euh, remarques sur euh, le fait que l'Union européenne participe à des programmes d'export de, de, de dispositifs de surveillance. Il, il se trouve que je suis également expert accrédité euh, par le service de l'action extérieure de l'Union européenne. Euh, et je peux vous dire que euh, les travaux que j'ai conduits pour eux euh, se situent dans un pur cadre d'assistance euh, des services partenaires de l'Union européenne euh, que je n'ai absolument pas constaté euh, ce, qui, ce qui est décrit là euh, et que l'état d'esprit en quelque sorte des, 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 des fonctionnaires hein, de l'Union européenne que j'ai rencontré à cette occasion était vraiment 
au contraire, de guider les pays partenaires dans un cadre plus normé. Et ce, que, ce qui permet euh, l'objectif ultime, c'est d'ouvrir de, 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 la voie à des enquêtes internationales qui, euh, qui impliquent des pays tiers où il puisse y avoir échange de renseignements entre ces pays et l'Union européenne. Donc, je n'ai pas constaté ce qui est décrit là, mais je n'ai pas tout vu non plus. Donc, je, je voulais juste vous apporter mon témoignage sur le sujet. Thank you very much. Let me pass the floor to Saskia Brigmo. And uh, uh, apologies, but I have to leave myself, but I will leave you in the good hands of our vice chair, Diana Riba. Please, Saskia. Thank you very much. Uh, Monsieur Giraud, je vais m'adresser à vous en, en français. Uh, merci à, à tous les trois uh, pour vos présentations extrêmement, uh, extrêmement précieuses pour notre travail et vos recommandations aussi. Euh, Monsieur Giraud, en tant que quelque part insider dans le domaine, euh, j'ai vraiment envie d'avoir votre, votre avis sur euh, la normalisation de l'utilisation de ce type de, de, de logiciel espion euh, dans les États tiers. Est-ce que vous estimez que c'est vraiment euh, widespread, euh, qu'il y a une utilisation massive, ou est-ce que vous pouvez vraiment, à la limite, cartographier euh, les principaux euh, utilisateurs de ces, de ces technologies de manière euh, intensive. Euh, aussi, j ai, j ai, enfin, vous avez une proposition hyper concrète de traçabilité, en fait. Euh, donc on pourrait réguler en, en assurant la traçabilité euh, des, des espionnages, euh, ce, qui est, euh, ce qui est une proposition qu'on qu n'avait jamais entendue euh, jusqu'à présent. Et donc, vous estimez que, d'un point de vue euh, euh, pratique, c'est faisable. Euh, et qu'est-ce que ça requiert derrière On parlait, euh, je, je ne sais plus lequel d'entre vous, mais je pense que c'est vous, d'un centre d'excellence européen euh, qui, qui permettrait d'organiser euh, et de, 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 de mettre en œuvre la législation est-ce qu'un tel centre serait à même d'assurer ce registre, cette traçabilité, une espèce sans doute de, 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 de codage euh, Enfin voilà, n'étant absolument pas experte en la matière, euh, je pense que ce serait euh, intéressant d'avoir vos, vos... Enfin, peut-être pas aujourd'hui et oralement, mais davantage de, de, de propositions euh, liées à ça. Et en lien avec euh, cette question-là, et je vais passer euh, en anglais, um, Mr. Ben Jacob, you said that um, we shouldn't um, legally um, uh, regulate all the different aspects, and you mentioned, for instance, uh, zero-day vulnerabilities, that we do not need to go into details, I would say. Uh, uh, no, that's not what you said. I misunderstood you then. Okay, you'll come back to it, but I, I'm... The opposite. Okay, the opposite. Okay, my bad. I, 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 don't, I don't want you to outlaw it. I don't want you to ban it in a broad blanket sense. I think that would be the most irresponsible thing. I want you to, I want us to regulate every facet, and I think regulation is a solution. That was my mm -hmm. position. I'm sorry if it wasn't clear. Okay, okay, no, perfect. Uh, so my, my question to you is mainly related to your work on Sudan. Uh, you revelated the export to Sudan. I would like to know a bit more about it. Uh, did you get any reaction uh, after uh, reporting on this case? Uh, do you know about the reactions of the uh, Greek and uh, Cyprus authorities? Because uh, in my uh, knowledge, this is completely illegal to uh, export such kind of uh, spyware to Sudan. Uh, so really interested in more um, exchanges about this uh, with you today and uh, what we should do from uh, EU level. Um, and then finally to um, Madame Siatitsa, I would like also to, to hear you about the use of um, spyware technologies in occupied territories in Israel. Do you have any uh, knowledge uh, on that? Any uh, reflections to share with us on um, testing of those technologies in the uh, occupied Uh, territories, and also um, if you have any other measures that you would suggest to us to better fight uh, spyware uh, attacks by uh, third countries. That's a, a general question, but um, it uh, would be interesting to hear you on that um, as well. And finally, for the three of you, um, I also think it would be interesting to have a, a, an état de l'art of the best practices, of the, the good uh, legislations that are into place uh, that uh, ensure oversight. 
Um, and there too, if you can contribute uh, already um, based on the knowledge you have on uh, good examples of uh, legislations, uh, that could be um, the, the, the starting point of an harmonization inside the EU. That would be also uh, interesting for us. Thank you very much. I will pass the floor. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, in the same order. Perfect. Okay. Um, euh, oui, à, à propos de la, la cartographie hein, des, des utilisateurs de logiciels espions, c'est vrai que c'est euh, euh, une question qui forcément euh, appelle une réponse euh, partielle et un peu subjective. Euh, euh, moi, j'observe simplement qu'il y a une vraie convergence entre, euh, quelque part, l'aspect maximaliste de la fonctionnalité qui est apportée par les logiciels espions, et le caractère euh, cynique de certaines diplomaties à travers le monde. Euh, je trouve qu'il y a une parfaite, euh, si vous voulez, il y a un parfait recouvrement des deux, c'est-à-dire que c'est des gens qui ne s'encombrent absolument pas de considérations euh, humaines, on va dire. Euh, il y a une région du monde qui a fait parler d'elle euh, récemment, et je, je pense à cette région, je trouve qu'il y, y a un très bon fit entre, entre l'outil qui est apporté et, la, et le caractère de cette diplomatie, mais c est, c est, je précise, c'est un jugement, euh, je suis désolé de le dire, c'est un jugement, donc euh, voilà. Euh, quant à la traçabilité, euh, oui, alors pourquoi, pourquoi je, je propose euh, ce, ce, ce mode opératoire euh, C'est très simple. En fait, euh, la bonne vieille interception téléphonique, hein, le wiretapping euh, d'antan, euh, avait, avait quand même un, un énorme avantage, c'est qu'il sollicitait l'opérateur téléphonique pour pouvoir, euh, pour pouvoir être exécuté. C'est-à-dire que L'opérateur téléphonique, c'est un acteur qui est, qui est très, très profondément ancré euh, dans l'État, qui a des obligations légales et euh, sur lequel on a un contrôle et qui ne peut... C'est en quelque sorte un tiers qui, qui garantit d'un côté donc, le service à l'utilisateur final et d'autre côté sa loyauté à l'État. Et euh, cet opérateur était un parfait support euh, pour appliquer, si vous voulez, des points de contrôle à tous les instants de la procédure. Donc, euh, quand on émettait une interception, enfin, on le fait toujours, hein, euh, on émet un, un, le juge euh, donne euh, l'autorisation à un service, il émet, il euh, y a un numéro qui est généré et qui est consigné dans une base de données de suivi de toutes les interceptions. Bon, avec les logiciels espions, on n'a pas ça. Parce que euh, c'est en quelque sorte, c'est du pair à pair. Moi, si j'ai assez d'argent, j'achète un serveur et je, je pirate votre téléphone. Euh, qui, qui va voir cette opération Personne. Euh, donc il faut s'appuyer sur d'autres euh, points pour arriver à une traçabilité. Et moi, ce que je propose, c'est de s'appuyer sur le téléphone de la cible qui lui porte en permanence la trace de l'action de piratage. Et donc, si à un moment, vous avez euh, un citoyen qui vient vous voir ou si vous êtes investi d'un pouvoir d'aller perquisitionner et de récupérer des téléphones, vous avez entre vos mains euh, cet outil qui porte la trace du piratage. Donc, euh, c'est pour ça que je propose de poser ici le point qui vient, en quelque sorte, euh, faire la connexion entre le, le logiciel et notre réalité. Donc c'est pour ça que je propose d'apposer un, un, un morceau de code qui viendrait euh, dans, le, dans le logiciel de piratage et qui serait donc déposé en même temps que l'infection sur le téléphone de la cible. C'est le seul moyen que j'ai trouvé qui permette, si vous voulez, de, à un moment d'avoir un, une trace. Et, et cette trace aurait été bien utile hein, quand le scandale Pegasus a éclaté euh, pour savoir euh, d'où venait le coup. Hein, euh, là, parce que là, aujourd'hui, on est quand même largement dans le flou encore. Et enfin, vous posez une question collective sur l'état de l'art. Il euh, y, y a effectivement des, 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 euh, des, des, des choses à prendre. Dans, en, moi, je peux parler de la législation euh, française. Euh, le législateur euh, a reconnu que l'enquêteur doit avoir connaissance dans certaines situations de, euh, de ce que le, le méchant, hein, le bad guy, euh, voit sur l'écran de sa machine et tape sur le clavier de sa machine. C'est une sorte de perquisition électronique euh, en temps réel et c'est l'esprit de la loi française qui s'est décliné donc, dans les articles que je vous ai cités. Euh, moi je trouve que c'est une bonne approche, euh, elle est certainement perfectible. Euh, voilà, donc euh, peut-être les législateurs français pourront vous aider euh, sur vraiment l'esprit de la loi euh, sur le sujet. Et euh, voilà, ça peut être un, un début et moi je ne peux vous parler que de la loi française en tout cas.
you can give the floor, uh, Omer Ben Jacob, for the second question that Saskia did. Yeah. So um, about the investigation that touched the Sudan, it was a it was a, a collective effort. So we were it was done together with Haaret, uh, amazing journalist in Greece from an or, a very important organization called Inside Stories, and also partners with the Lighthouse, which I'm sure you're as Europeans familiar with. Um, the reporters for the Lighthouse uh, would be much better suited to address uh, questions directly relating to Sudan, just because I'm less knowledgeable about that and then less connected there. Um, ironically, I think we did get at some point some response from the Sudanese uh, forces uh, that they said something along the lines of, uh, you know, us being fake news and so on. Um, uh, so just just in terms of that uh, uh, and, and, and about Sudan, so in that sense, I'm not, I'm, I, I don't know to answer that. But my, my, my thinking about this, just listening also now to the previous uh, expert, is that I think there are a few good practices that, 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 that should be used. And I think this also touches the question about uh, the way these technologies are used in the Israeli, as part of the Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. Um, that when these technologies are export, exported, they can only be exported as a technology, not as a service. And I think that's a huge thing. Uh, and this distinction between technology and service is actually very important. I think that's a very good practice thing to uh, to, to think about. So, for example, when, when when NSO sells stuff to Israel, it can sell it without regulation. In a sense, Israel is the only country that you can export cyber to with no regulation. So it's the only country that it's like it's, it's a priori excluded from all exports because it's not an export. It's local for us. Uh, and I think this distinction is actually very promising and very lucrative for you as legislators to think about this distinction between tech and service uh, because there's a big question if you give someone a gun, which you might not like, but there's a big difference between giving them that gun and training them how to use it. When we talk about non-kinetic weapons like cyber, this is actually very, 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 very important. And it also touches to uh, some of the things I think that were raised earlier about different types of hacks that also don't leave forensics. I think it's very important to understand NSO and firms like NSO are the high end of a very big market. Phones are not the only thing people are hacking. If I wanted to destroy all of your careers, your phones would be one way to do that. One out of many. For example, your computer would probably be more lucrative to me, for example. Um, and I think we, we need to, 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 to it, I'll be really honest, like stop obsessing about NSO. Like it, it's not, even intellect in it of itself is interesting because it showcases that there are 14 or 13 different services. Um, and I think that's a very important thing to remember because when we move forward on regulation, you'll quickly discover that any of these services are irrelevant to your regulation. So, for example, zero day or zero clicks, right? Completely irrelevant when you talk about SS7 hackings, which are still a thing, still a thing that governments do uh, to geolocate uh, dissidents or citizens. And, and, and in that sense, we, I'm not sure that the solution of like fingerprinting uh, you know, I don't know, like a state packet on the SS7 could work. So I think we need to think about this just slightly more broadly. And I think the tech versus service distinction is actually very lucrative because then you can say, hey, you can't sell hacking as a service. I don't care if you do it with a chainsaw or with a Pegasus. We, you can't sell that as a service. It's just not a service you can provide. So that to me seems to be like a very kind of lucrative kind of uh, thing. And I think I also touched on the Palestinian issue very briefly, though that wasn't necessarily for me. Ms. Cecilia Siatitsa, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, as uh, reported by civil society groups like Hamle and by former Israeli soldiers, uh, the Israeli authorities have control over the technical infrastructure in Palestine giving them wide-scale access to Palestinian communications, the technical details of which, as you can ima imagine, aren't widely reported. Um, by controlling the technical infrastructure, however, and what the former soldiers report, they routinely, routinely can access phones. And uh, I would uh, recommend reading the testimonies of these soldiers and can share a link afterwards uh, for the committee's attention. Um, specifically when it comes to the use of the NSO's power, Al Jazeera reported um, last year uh, about at least six Palestinian activists uh, being affected uh, with the spire that I would be happy to share 
Um, and uh, finally, um, there's been wide reports with regards um, uh, and uh, in addition to Spire, they have been intention. Uh, they have been wide reporting around the intensive and growing surveillance of public space spaces, such as checkpoints. And uh, most notably, Privacy International has published a report that I'm happy also to share um, uh, with regard to a company called Anyvision that sells facial recognition technologies. And which um, has recent and which has been installed in checkpoints across, um, and uh, which has recently rebranded itself these cap capabilities uh, around the world. Um, I, with regard to your question of regulation, I would be grateful if you could repeat, um, just as uh, I, I missed the entire um, question. Thank you. It was mainly about your specific recommendations uh, for the regulation at EU level uh, in terms of uh, exports of such technologies and their use. It, it's a broad question, I realize. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, no, I, I mean, Again, I mean, depends on on what side the exports are coming. Uh, I, in my presentation, spoke uh, specifically on how, uh, through uh, aid and development assistance, exports have been facilitated from the EU countryside. Um, and uh, in that regard, I think it would be key for um, the EU to become the lead in ensuring that there is transparency with regard to the exports, what type of surveillance, to whom, to which agencies, and under which uh, brand. It could be uh, a few of the um, key solutions that could be put in place with regard to regulation. And, and further, as, as I mentioned as before, ensuring that there are appropriate human rights impacts and risk assessments before um, um, permitting, authorizing any of these exports. Uh, it would be necessary to ensure that uh, the EU does not find itself facilitating um, abuses of, uh, of such technologies. Um, I'm, I'm it, it's a very broad question, uh, as you've mentioned, so it's, it's very difficult to just include everything. But again, also, I'm happy to further share um, specific, more detailed recommendations with regard to regulations that uh, we have uh, published. Okay, thank you. Now is the turn of Mr. Puchamon. You want to take off? Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you to all of uh, you for your explanations here. I have a, a, a concrete uh, question to uh, Ms. Siatitsa. Uh, in your presentation, you, exp you, you, you explained that uh, a case and, and the Spanish police uh, uh, are teaching uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina police on the use of malware. Uh, could you be more concrete? Could you enlarge your explanation on this case? But because that could be very interesting to us to know if there is a, a member of state who are teaching another member of state, another member of the European uh, the, uh, of the Europe, uh, on the use of malware. Et après, j'ai une question aussi pour euh, Monsieur euh, Giraud. Euh, vous avez euh, parlé de vos recommandations euh, que je partage en général, mais il y a aussi un, une question que, que je n'ai pas réussi à, à, à éclaircir. Um, ces marquages, ces, ces morceaux de code que vous euh, suggérez de, de mettre dans les le, le, le dispositif euh, appareil, qui, qui doit le faire C'est la même compagnie qui fabrique les logiciels espions, donc on doit faire confiance à ce qui en fait connaît tous les tous les secrets, qui peut même aussi trouver la façon de cacher euh, dans ces mêmes logiciels une façon de dissimuler des actions non légales euh, de l'usage de l'espion, de, de, de software espion, et où 
qui doit contrôler, c'est l'État qui, en fait, qui utilise de façon générale ces sortes de logiciels de façon mauvaise. On doit faire aussi confiance aux États qui nous doivent assurer nos droits et qu'ils ne vont pas utiliser cette capacité presque illimitée de nous surveiller pour des mauvais usages. Merci. Okay. Uh, you can give the floor, Guillem Tirao. Euh, oui, merci pour votre question. Euh, D'abord, je précise que ces recommandations que, que j'aimais aujourd'hui, euh, je ne les ai pas fait euh, analyser par, euh, par des pairs. Donc, euh, elles sortent directement de, de, de mon cerveau et c'est la première fois que, que je les partage. Et, et je serais très heureux, justement, si, si, si vous les passez à votre esprit critique et que, comme ça, nous puissions commencer un échange. Euh, euh, oui, je, en fait, le... Le préliminaire, euh, c'est euh, d'établir, pour moi, hein, vraiment la première étape dans le, dans, sur le sujet qui nous intéresse, c'est d'établir une distinction claire entre euh, des sociétés qui auront été accréditées par l'Union européenne et les autres. C'est vraiment la, pour moi la première étape. Je peux vous assurer que les, 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 les gens, moi je, je, je travaille depuis, dans ce secteur depuis 25 ans, je connais énormément de monde et il y a vraiment deux profils dans ce monde. Il y a les gens qui comme moi sont très légalistes, qui sont passés par un service d'État ou qui le sont encore et qui sont vraiment imprégnés de, de l'esprit du service public. Et il y a des gens qui veulent faire de l'argent. Et ça peut paraître presque une caricature de bande dessinée, ce que je vous dis là, mais c'est la réalité que moi j'ai toujours vue dans ce métier. Donc il faut, il faut établir une distinction entre des sociétés qui auront été accréditées par l'Union européenne. Et pour cela, euh, je, on, on peut déjà s'appuyer sur les processus qui existent dans de nombreux États membres. Euh, en France, il y a un processus hein, d'accréditation des sociétés qui veulent éditer ces logiciels, qui sont reconnus comme extrêmement intrusifs. Il y a une procédure très très poussée, je peux, je peux en témoigner. Euh, et euh, il s'agirait en fait pour l'Europe de construire un étage supérieur à cet édifice déjà existant pour collecter toutes les certifications, euh, s'assurer qu'elles répondent à un cahier des charges normalisé et pour pouvoir apposer un, un numéro d'identification à chacun des éditeurs au sein de l'Union européenne. Et, et, et comme ça, oui, euh, je pense qu'on pourrait commencer à construire un système de confiance euh, où on reconnaîtrait les gens qui sont donc de confiance et les autres. Et les gens qui sont de confiance, on pourrait peut-être les questionner sur leur utilisation des logiciels, mais au moins, on sait qu'ils qu agiraient déjà dans, dans, dans un cadre bien, bien normalisé. Voilà. Ok, sorry. I, I don't know that the first one. Ok, the floor is yours, Ilia Siatitsa. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, for the question. Um, let me start by explaining how we came across uh, this information. Um, uh, in 2019, uh, we started submitting freedom of information requests, access to documents requests to various EU institutions, including CEPOL, which is um, the European Union's law enforcement training agency. And through it, um, through answers to the request, the request was asking about any assistance, whether equipment training or other, that is that third countries, non-EU member countries have received. Uh, from EU institutions and other, and through it we've received a series of um, documents from CEPOL, including training material, um, and uh, one of which was uh, a quite, a, quite a lot of information within this material was redacted, but then uh, there was a presentation uh, that I've mentioned and uh, given by the Spanish police to Bosnian Herzegovinian authorities. And within it, there was a slide that spoke about uh, malware and Trojans. Uh, I, in my presentation before, I've on the slide, there was actually a screenshot of exactly what we have received. One of the pictures, uh, one of the slides of, of what we have received. 
and uh, we can also share the the entire um uh, we have published the documents and i would be happy to share a link with the full um uh training um and information we we have seen thank you now the last question uh breton the floor is yours Merci, Madame la Présidente. J'ai une question pour Monsieur Giraud. Alors moi, je suis comme vous. Je pense que l'utilisation des logiciels espions par les États est nécessaire pour d'évidentes raisons de sécurité nationale. Mais bien sûr, il faut prendre des précautions. Et vous avez dit quelque chose de très intéressant, mais que je n'ai toujours pas très bien compris. Vous avez dit qu'on pourrait améliorer la traçabilité de l'infection des téléphones portables par des logiciels espions. Et à partir de là, vous avez dit qu'on pourrait imaginer un système de codage. Vous avez parlé aussi de sociétés accréditées par l'Union européenne, un système qu'on pourrait mettre en place. Et alors, moi, je voudrais vraiment que vous fassiez un effort de pédagogie, parce que c'est très, très nébuleux dans mon esprit. Euh, qui serait chargé de mettre en place ce dispositif de codage Est-ce que ce sont les fabricants de téléphones portables Est-ce que ce sont les exploitants de logiciels espions euh, là, je pense que vous avez exploré une piste très intéressante pour nous et j'aimerais être sûr de vous comprendre. Merci d'avance. Euh, oui, merci pour votre question. Et à vous écouter, je me rends compte que j'ai oublié de répondre sur ce point à la question précédente. Donc euh, c'est l'occasion. Euh, oui, alors très, très concrètement, euh, il existe... En fait, il y a, il y a, dans mon métier, il y a, il y a deux techniques hein, pour capter les informations dont on a besoin pour l'enquête, ce qu'on appelle des techniques spéciales d'enquête. Euh, il y a la captation dont on parle aujourd'hui, hein, qui est euh, l'action de déposer euh, un code malveillant sur un logiciel euh, d'une cible pour euh, capter les informations à la source. Et il y a la bonne vieille interception de communication qui est euh, délivrée par l'opérateur et qui consiste à euh, dupliquer, euh, en quelque sorte, euh, le, le, le flux de communication tel qu'il passe dans le, dans le réseau de l'opérateur. Donc ça, c'était la, la bonne vieille technique. Euh, et il se trouve que cette technique euh, est normalisée de manière très précise par un institut européen qui est l'ETSI. Il y a un groupe de travail qui s'appelle LI pour Lawful Intercept. Et... Euh, ce groupe de travail, qui travaille depuis très 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 longtemps sur le sujet, moi je l'ai toujours connu, euh, euh, justement, édicte des règles euh, qu'il faut respecter. Et ces règles se composent de quoi Elles se composent de protocoles de communication, c'est-à-dire une syntaxe qui va définir quels sont les échanges de données qu'il peut y avoir entre la société qui va délivrer le logiciel espion et celle qui doit le superviser, et des règles d'implémentation, c'est-à-dire qu'il va y avoir à un moment une obligation pour ces sociétés de mettre en place un serveur qui va communiquer les données administratives à un serveur de l'administration, laquelle administration va tenir un registre de toutes ces données. Et ça, c'est le parfait modèle qu'il faut suivre, puisque je peux vous dire que ce secteur-là marche très très bien, euh, C'est une communauté qui vit en Europe et qui, euh, qui, qui construit des, des produits et des logiciels qui fonctionnent très très bien. Donc euh, sur la base de ce modèle, moi ce que je propose c'est de construire un modèle similaire pour le, la, la deuxième jambe hein, de, 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 de l'accès aux communications des cibles qui est la captation dont on parle aujourd'hui. Et elle est inexistante. Elle est juste inexistante à travers le monde et il faudrait effectivement, je pense, établir un, un bureau exécutif hein, avec une capacité opérationnelle dans les locaux d'une institution européenne euh, qui aurait le pouvoir euh, d'édicter la norme en question, euh, d'implémenter physiquement des serveurs à un niveau central qui seraient en charge de recevoir les informations des différents États membres, lesquels États membres seraient en charge de collecter auprès des sociétés qui sont de leur ressort territorial euh, les identifiants de, de leurs produits et, et les identifiants aussi de toutes les enquêtes auxquelles ils participent. Donc euh, vous auriez en quelque sorte une pyramide de, de serveurs où le... La société éditrice se verrait dans l'obligation, quand elle, quand elle actionne le bouton pour aller infecter euh, un téléphone, d'y apposer un, une étiquette. Laquelle étiquette serait, euh, serait euh, communiquée à un serveur de l'État membre et lequel État membre 
collecterait et rassemblerait toutes ces étiquettes, tous ces flux et les enverrait au niveau de, de, de l'Union européenne pour, pour un but évident de, de contrôle et de régulation. Euh, voilà. Bon, bien évidemment, ce que je vous dis là en cinq minutes, c'est un, un brouillon. Euh, je, donc le groupe de travail LI de l'ETSI travaille sur ce sujet depuis plus de 30 ans à ma connaissance. Et, je n'aurais pas la prétention de, 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 de faire quelque chose de, de, de performant en cinq minutes, mais je, je, je jette l'idée. Euh, voilà. I think we have a last quick uh, question because we have a second panel this morning. Follow-up question. C'est une question de suivi pour Monsieur euh, Giraud. Je vais encore une fois, je vais peut-être abuser un peu en faisant appel à votre subjectivité, <rire> mais euh, vous parliez donc voilà l'état de l'art, la loi française qui semble intéressante à, à, à investiguer un petit peu. Est-ce que c'est aussi dans l'esprit de la loi française euh, de se laisser espionner Parce qu'on parle, euh, enfin voilà, vous dites qu'il existe un cadre, qu'il existe quand même euh, des, 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 des contraintes dans l'utilisation par, la, par, par euh, la France de ce type de logiciel. Euh, mais d'un autre côté, on sait que euh, des Français, y compris le président Macron, ont été euh, surveillés et ça a donné lieu à absolument euh, pas avoir prou de réaction politique. Euh, à ma connaissance, pas non plus sur, sur, sur le banc parlementaire. Et donc, enfin, je, on s'est interrogé largement euh, au niveau de cette commission d'enquête sur l'absence de réaction des États membres en général quand des scandales euh, ont été révélés, euh, et de la France en particulier. Est-ce que ça fait partie de cette diplomatie du cynisme Parce qu'on sait que c'est largement répandu et que, de, de toute façon, euh, on, 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 est-ce que c'est une forme de naïveté euh, de la part euh, des autorités euh, euh, européenne et de, et de nos gouvernements. Euh, Qu'est-ce que c'est en fait Comment est-ce qu'on peut qualifier cette absence de réaction euh, selon vous Merci. Euh, oui, je vous en prie. Euh, oui, alors, le, le, dans le cas précis, moi je suis très mal à l'aise pour commenter euh, le cas précis que vous mentionnez hein, de, 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 de ce, ce, ce scandale hein, en quelque sorte qui a, qui a mis en scène une, une, une palanquée de députés, de, de ministres euh, français, de notre président, euh, qui, aurait, qui ont été infectés par, par un logiciel espion. Euh, je ne suis pas dans le, dans le, dans le secret euh, du Cénacle, mais. Euh, je sais que de nombreuses actions internes ont été entreprises. Euh, donc euh, je, je, je ne pense pas qu'il y ait une naïveté euh, et il y a une réaction très forte. Euh, je pense qu'au niveau diplomatique, ça a eu un impact aussi vis-à-vis euh, -vis des protagonistes. Euh, mais euh, ce qui caractérise la mandature actuelle, euh, c'est le secret. C'est euh, pas de pas de vague. Pas, on ne doit rien voir à l'extérieur. Donc, euh, je, je, je suis bien incapable de, 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 de commenter. Euh, à contrario, euh, à contrario, euh, en, quand euh, un logiciel espion euh, <coughs> euh, s'attaque à une cible légitime de l'administration française, euh, du point de vue judiciaire, donc il faut que ça soit autorisé par un juge et c'est très bien codifié, euh, et du point de vue du renseignement, c'est également codifié parce que ça, ça a été codifié donc, dans le code de sécurité intérieure qui est assez récent mais qui, qui est euh, une excellente lecture je trouve. Euh, quand je l'ai découvert en tout cas, je, je, je l'ai dévoré en quelque sorte parce que ça pose très bien euh, le cadre euh, d'application de, justement de, de, des services de renseignement, c'est le livre 8 hein, du code de sécurité intérieure. Le, le, le préambule du livre 8 est très intéressant parce qu'il dispose tous les, tous les cas de figure où justement le renseignement est compétent et c'est une liste euh, fermée euh, de points sur lesquels on peut agir pour euh, poser euh, ce genre de, de technique. I wish to thank our speakers for their intervention and answers. Thank you very much to be here with us this morning. Thank you. Uh, we will make a short break before starting our second panel of the day. But we, we have all? Okay, yeah. we can go. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay. In this second panel, we have invited the speakers to present a more institutional view at what is happening in relation to first countries. To participate in this panel, we will have the, follow speak, uh, the following speakers. Senor Pedro Baca Villarreal, a special rapporteur for freedom of expression and the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. Uh, he is remotely connected. 
and Mrs. Marta Hisienlinska, uh, Principal Advisor of the Charter of the Fundamental Rights European Ombudsman. I will ask the member who wishes to take the floor for this panel to indicate to me and the Secretariat during the statement of the speaker. Uh, without further delay, I will start with our first speaker, El Señor Pedro Vaca Villarreal. Uh, I thank you for participation in such an early hour from Washington, D.C. I understand you will be speaking Spanish for your intervention. You have the floor for 10 minutes. Are you? Muy, muy buenos días eh, a todos, a todas. En primer lugar, quisiera agradecer eh, por esta invitación a la presidencia del comité, a los vicepresidentes y a todos los miembros del comité de investigación sobre el uso de Pegasus en el Parlamento Europeo. Les habla Pedro Baca Villarreal. Actualmente estoy a cargo de la Relatoría Especial para la Libertad de Expresión de la Organización de los Estados Americanos. La Relatoría es una oficina permanente que actúa desde 1997 dentro de la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos y que tiene como fin principal estimular la defensa del derecho a la libertad de pensamiento y expresión en las Américas. En 2017, hace ya cinco años, la Relatoría Especial para la Libertad de Expresión tomó conocimiento de los primeros reportes relacionados con el uso del software malicioso de espionaje Pegasus en las Américas. De acuerdo con la información recibida entonces, entre enero de 2015 y agosto de 2016 se habrían registrado al menos 97 intentos de infección de teléfonos de periodistas, defensores y defensoras de derechos humanos, abogados, opositores políticos y en general de personas que participaban activamente de la vida pública en México. La lista de personas luego se conocería habría, que habrían sido infectadas también incluiría un reportero asesinado en México en el año 2017. Entre el año 2019 y el año 2022, la Relatoría Especial recibió información sobre el uso de Pegasus contra periodistas y personas defensoras de derechos humanos en al menos otras cuatro oportunidades. En 2019 se denunciaron de, de forma global eh, un, 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 un planteamiento en el cual alrededor de 1.400 personas en al menos 20 países del mundo habrían sido atacadas con Pegasus y según se sostuvo entonces, México sería uno de los países con la mayor cantidad de víctimas de este espionaje durante los primeros meses del año 2019. En 2021, otra denuncia global reveló que los teléfonos de al menos 180 periodistas habrían sido seleccionados en 20, pa en 20 países por al menos 10 clientes de la empresa NSO, y de acuerdo con la información pública de entonces, casi un tercio de los 50.000 números telefónicos presuntamente infectados para espionaje estarían basados en México, por lo que habría, se habría apuntado en aquel entonces México como una de las ubicaciones con mayor interés en la adquisición de este software malicioso. En enero de este año, el año 2022, se dieron a conocer nuevos casos de espionaje en la región de las Américas, esta vez en El Salvador. El reporte determinó que al menos 35 pers medio, personas de medios de comunicación y organizaciones de la sociedad civil salvadoreñas habrían sido intervenidas en sus teléfonos. Seguido a esto, las propias autoridades salvadoreñas indicaron en audiencia pública ante la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos, eso fue en marzo de este año, que funcionarios públicos también habrían, si habrían recibido alertas de intervención en sus teléfonos. Eh, hay, hay un caso eh, de este último reporte, que es el del caso del medio del Faro, en el cual quisiera detenerme. Eh, de los 22 miembros del medio del Faro, un medio de investigación en El Salvador, que habrían sido intervenidos, 19 de ellos y ellas eran beneficiarios de medidas cautelares de la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos desde el 4 de enero del año 2021. Y en efecto, un número muy importante de las intervenciones o los hits eh, habrían tenido lugar entre abril y mayo de 2021, tres meses después de que se emitieran las medidas cautelares para una porción significativa de la sala de redacción. Finalmente, en octubre de este año, en, mediante la investigación periodística Ejército Espía en México, también se habrían denunciado nuevos casos de espionaje, en los que organismos de seguridad habrían adquirido un sistema de monitoreo remoto de información a la empresa con representación exclusiva para vender Pegasus en ese país. Eh, según los reportes e investigaciones allegados a nuestra oficina, principalmente por organizaciones de la sociedad civil, 
las víctimas de infección con Pegasus no estaban involucradas en actividades criminales, que entiendo es lo que la empresa que lo comercializa indica sería la finalidad que persigue este software. Por el contrario, las personas ejercían actividades especialmente protegidas por el derecho internacional de los derechos humanos. En efecto, al momento de los ataques, la mayor parte de las personas investigaban e informaban sobre asuntos de interés público y elevada sensibilidad como corrupción, narcotráfico y graves violaciones a los derechos humanos. Este es un aspecto que resulta particularmente grave, en tanto las prácticas de espionaje no solo vulneran el derecho a la privacidad y la libertad de expresión de las propias víctimas, sino que también tiene el potencial efecto de incidir negativamente en la integridad de fuentes periodísticas y otras personas del entorno cercano de las víctimas. Hay un alto potencial de que el universo de víctimas sea mayor. Sin embargo, con lo que hasta el momento se conoce, eh, se da cuenta de una situación grave respecto de la cual quisiera ser muy claro en al menos tres asuntos que considero relevantes. El primero es que los despliegues institucionales no han contado con capacidades normativas y de voluntad política suficientes para prevenir abusos en el uso de tecnologías como Pegasus. El segundo es que se han denunciado públicamente abusos de esta tecnología, pero con el paso del tiempo no hay esclarecimiento de los hechos y en cambio aumentan el número de casos. Y el tercer elemento que considero muy relevante es que ante violaciones a los derechos humanos el sistema interamericano reclama sanciones ejemplarizantes y determinación de responsabilidades. A la fecha, no conocemos de avances judiciales significativos en los reportes que les mencioné anteriormente. Desde el año 2017, representantes de la sociedad civil han expresado preocupaciones sobre las investigaciones que deberían esclarecer estos hechos. Debo decir que los estados del de Salvador y México han declarado estar adelantando investigaciones para esclarecer los hechos. En noviembre de 2021, incluso, la oficina que lideró reconoció progresos modestos en el marco de la investigación judicial sobre el uso de Pegasus en México y llamó al Estado a adoptar las medidas necesarias para garantizar la integridad de las víctimas y sus representantes, así como de todas las personas vinculadas al proceso judicial. Igualmente, a comienzos de este año, sobre los hallazgos en El Salvador, el Estado señaló que hay en curso una investigación que calificó como exhaustiva. Las autoridades indicaron que el origen de tales intervenciones es desconocido por lo que se encontraría desarrollando estas investigaciones a fin de determinar las responsabilidades y autoridades de los hechos, los cuales, insisto, también habrían vulnerado dispositivos y comunicaciones de funcionarios estatales. Si es una reflexión, y es que, paradójicamente, una herramienta que es usada a raíz de ejercicios de cooperación pública y privada en materia de seguridad, no cuenta con los mismos niveles de cooperación para el esclarecimiento y la sanción de los abusos. Hay cooperación privada para la inversión y el desarrollo de tecnología, hay cooperación pública en materia de seguridad, pero no hay suficiente cooperación para garantizar los derechos de las víctimas de los abusos. En este contexto, es fundamental reiterar las obligaciones de los Estados, al menos en el marco del sistema interamericano, de debida diligencia, transparencia y rendición de cuentas, especialmente en términos de contratación y supervisión de los servicios prestados por parte de actores privados y el deber de las compañías privadas de adecuar su actuación a estándares internacionales de derechos humanos, tomando en cuenta medidas para mitigar y reparar los daños causados. Una gran dificultad que hemos registrado es la, los obstáculos para contar con una base de información mínima y suficiente que permita atender dos desafíos simultáneos. El primero es esclarecer y reparar los abusos cometidos y el segundo es evitar efectivamente que estos abusos se repitan. En el primer plano se nos ha indicado, por ejemplo, que incluso requerimientos judiciales no son respondidos con suficiencia tanto por parte de las entidades públicas que potencialmente puedan estar involucradas como de las empresas que estarían llamadas a contribuir a la verdad. Por razones de tiempo eh, voy simplemente a, a, a cerrar indicando que se ha recabado información de personas que desarrollan actividades legítimas y trascendentales en sociedades democráticas y estos asuntos demandan del Estado de Derecho esclarecimiento, reparaciones y medidas de no repetición. En el caso de la prensa, 
requerimos de una prensa libre, no de una prensa intimidada o temerosa de tomar contacto con sus fuentes. Para finalizar, reiterar el llamado que ya hemos venido realizando de forma conjunta con la Oficina del Alto Comisionado para los Derechos Humanos de la ONU con respecto al llamado a la, mor a la moratoria inmediata sobre la venta, transferencia y el uso de la tecnología de vigilancia hasta que se tengan marcos normativos mínimos en línea con derechos humanos que prevengan los abusos que hemos venido documentando. Cierro animando a profundizar el intercambio de experiencias entre el sistema interamericano y las instituciones europeas en esta materia. El ámbito multilateral es en nuestro criterio un, un espacio trascendental para sortear los desafíos como el que hoy nos convoca y quedo muy atento a las eventuales preguntas que puedan tener. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, señor Baca Villarreal. And now I turn out to our second and final speaker, this is Marta Hitch Siendinska, principal advisor on the Charter of Fundamental Rights at the Office of the European Ombudsman here in Strasbourg. Uh, you will present to the members uh, the uh, Ombudsman recent decision on how the European Commission assesses the human rights impact before providing support to African countries to develop surveillance capabilities. The decision was circulated to the members ahead of these hearings. You have the floor for 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for having invited the European Ombudsman um, today. And I would just add to, uh, we just heard that uh, the title which officially we given to the cases, it was that the European Commission, how the European Commission assessed the human rights impact. But in fact, the Commission did not. Um, we, um, just to explain our findings, I think I need first to say a few words about the background of the case, um, namely uh, speak a few words uh, about the European Union Emergency Trust Fund for Stability and addressing root causes of irregular migration and displaced persons in Africa. This fa trust fund was created in 2015, so in the middle of, of the huge uh, um, uh, migration, as we said, crisis, and the European Commission, 25 European Union member states, Norway, Switzerland, signed the constitutive agreement of the Trust Fund for Africa. Uh, the majority of funding for this trust is coming from the European Development Fund, about 70%, and 20% from other programs, and 7% uh, of funding comes from the member states and other donors. Uh, the European Commission acts as a representative of the European Union, obviously, and it is a, call it, is a manager of, of this trust fund. Um, we have even a special member of the Commission who is really a manager of, of the fund. And uh, the initiatives founded by the European Union Trust Fund for Africa um, are implemented either by the direct management by the Commission or indirect management with partners such as International Organization for Migration, uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights of the United Nations, or International Labour Organization. And we received a complaint by the end of last year. Uh, the complaint was submitted to the Ombudsman by six uh, civic society organizations, among them Privacy International and uh, International Federation for Human Rights, just to name two. Um, these organizations have very, very strong concerns about the projects covered by the uh, European Union Trust Fund for Africa, projects involving the transfer of surveillance capabilities uh, to the African countries with poor human rights records, poor governance. And uh, the complainants to the Ombudsman actually referred to two kinds of projects, projects to create biometric databases by the administrations of the African countries, um, including providing them by the Union with technical equipment for information data analysis. And second kind of projects to which they referred were projects to provide African countries with surveillance equipment, such phone interception systems, along with knowledge and surveillance techniques and other equipment, all to strengthen their border management. Obviously, there is a risk in uh, such countries with a recent history of human rights violations, poor governance, that they could use biometric data for unlawful trafficking, uh, tracking and monitoring uh, of individuals. And the complainants told the Ombudsman that in this situation, it is obvious that before deciding to fund such initiatives, the Commission should have carried out a prior risk and impact assessment um, to ensure that any transfer of technology with potential surveillance capacity will not result in violations of human rights, such as the right to privacy and other rights. 
and they gave us examples of, of what is happening in Niger, for, Niger, for instance, or in Libya, obviously, um, when, for instance, Niger was provided with surveillance drones, cameras, uh, surveillance software, wild typing center, um, etc., and the transfer of this all surveillance equipment came in the context of uh, crackdown on activists in Niger. The Ombudsman opened the inquiry and uh, she asked the Commission actually two things. Uh, whether it carries out any kind of human rights risk or impact assessment prior to approving initiatives under the, the European Union Trust Fund for Africa. And secondly, uh, to explain what other measures the Commission puts in place to protect human rights in the context of projects implemented uh, in these African countries under the Trust Fund. And the Commission replied actually with two, three arguments. First, the Commission said, that, uh, yeah, the tr European Trust Fund, what they are doing is covered by European financial regulation. There is also European Union Trust Fund's guidelines, um, which applies to the projects in question. But there is no legal obligation for the Commission to carry out a human rights impact assessment before these activities take place. Secondly, the Commission said that, that the main responsibility for assuring respect of human rights lies with the national so African governments. And thirdly, the Commission said that the measures it put in place, and here they referred to three measures, multi-layer approval, pardon? Multi-layer approval process of projects, use of specific documentations of projects, which the Commission calls action documents, and thirdly, possible suspension of funds. So all these three measures are enough to uh, ensure, to mitigate the risks for human rights. And um, in this way, the Commission guarantees the human rights approach, as they said, to, um, to these activities. Um, what the Ombudsman found after the investigation? First, I want to, to, to underline that the question before the Ombudsman was not a question as to whether surveillance capabilities should or should not be, have been transferred. This was not the issue for us. The question was whether the Commission informs itself and assesses fully and properly risks to human rights in that context. Because principles of good administration, the Ombudsman says again and again, require that the Commission carries out its tasks with due diligence. And the Ombudsman also referred to other inquiries we had uh, concerning free trade agreements in which the Ombudsman said already that human rights impact assessments can identify the sources of the risk at each stage. And such assessment has a preventive role. Uh, if something negative impact is identified, uh, then the provisions could be still modified or mitigating measures could be decided before the agreements enters into force. And this applies also to this situation, said the Ombudsman. And the Ombudsman finally underlined that prior uh, human rights impact assessment um, concerning these projects uh, could also um, help the Commission to act transparently and better reply to the public concerns um, concerning the European Union involvement in, in this kind of projects uh, in these specific countries. And what we could verify, of course, on the website of the Commission, uh, we could uh, read quite a lot of details about different projects, but there was no word about, yes, how? I have the impression that the interpreters are trying to tell you you're too fast, too fast. no? Ah, okay, okay. I sent them the text, so I hope that they would be able to follow. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, this is the point. One year of investigation, and I have to summarize this in 10 minutes. Quite difficult, uh, but I, I, I try to do my best. Well, I, I will slow a bit. So, um, uh, the, first, the, the important issues also was the transparency for the Ombudsman, because if prior to these projects, there is a human rights impact assessment, which is, of course, published. Um, the public concerns about the European Union involvement in all these activities in these African countries about surveillance capabilities could be somehow, I mean, um, I would say, clarified. Uh, what we can see on the website of the Commission, for instance, about the Trust Fund for Africa, there are many details of the projects, and these projects are so many. Uh, as regards the migration, strengthening the border management, there are altogether about 80 projects, for instance. But there are no details about how these projects uh, were adopted, how were they implemented. And um, the Commission also published something which they call a European Union Trust Fund for Africa risk um, 
a register. But this register uh, doesn't uh, include human rights risks, like it would not have been a human rights risk, which is very strange. And the ombudsman also underlined it and following what the complainants told us, of course, which is uh, evident that uh, in these countries when these projects are implemented, uh, there are major governance issues, poor human rights records, and um, if the surveillance capabilities, technologies, capacity is transferred and used by the partner countries, African countries, for different purposes that the purpose foreseen under the project, there is a risk for human rights of individuals in these countries, as well as for the ability for the union to fulfill or realize its human rights obligations. And the commission didn't challenge this view of the ombudsman. But the commission said, as I told you, that there are other measures and these measures are enough and could replace somehow human rights impact assessment. But the ombudsman didn't agree with the commission. First, she said that suspension of funding, if the Commission finds human rights violations in the implementation of, uh, of the trust fund project, is a reactive measure. So the goal is to prevent the human rights um, uh, uh, violations um, if we do this prior human rights impact assessment. Suspension of funding, so it's not a sufficient measure. Uh, the Commission relied on so-called action documents. For each project, there is a special action document, um, uh, some documentation, quite detailed. But we look it into 20 projects. We choose 20 projects just as a sample. Uh, we look it into projects uh, which concern Niger, Algeria, Egypt, Libya, Morocco, Tunisia, Djibouti, Somalia, Sudan, uh, Ivory Coast, and Senegal. Already these countries uh, tell per se. Uh, what could happen there. And uh, in these action documents, we didn't find any proper human rights impact assessments. Um, the action documents were drafted um, in a way very unstructured. Uh, the methodology applied were very confusing, was very confusing. There were some uh, chapters like risk as, as uh, assumptions and uh, cross-cutting issues with which human rights issues were somehow mentioned. But what is essential for the Commission in this document was to show the risk for the project itself and not the risk for human rights of individuals. And finally, the multi-layer approval procedure to which uh, the Commission referred. Um, it was a procedure very much simplified, very quick. Uh, there was no possibility in few days uh, which were foreseen for this procedure to, uh, to have diligent assessment of human rights impacts. And the question that it is the emergency fund doesn't exclude that the approval procedure could be much better. The Ombudsman concluded the Commission um, was not able to demonstrate that the measure in place uh, ensures a current and structured approach to assessing the human rights impacts of European Union Trust Fund projects. And the Ombudsman also saw about the future because this Trust Fund for Africa is one of the trust funds. There would be others and maybe development financing will go on the base of such uh, solutions. And this is why the Ombudsman made suggestion for improvement for the future. Um, she, um, this suggestion was quite administrative in kind, but uh, very important. I think that sometimes the Ombudsman tells the Commission this is the way you have to, 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 uh, to assess uh, our suggestion and maybe this could help. And we told them that they should have a separate document, um, a standalone document, uh, distinct from, as they call it, action document in which you, we, the Commission should uh, assess all potential human rights impacts of projects um, and present also mitigations measures uh, together. So um, we suggested that the Commission could review the, the current template they have of the action document uh, to reflect these suggestions. And we ex expect the Commission's reply to the Ombudsman's suggestion uh, in the early spring next year. And uh, yeah, we will see what they will tell us. Anyway, uh, the investigation um, was uh, very interesting. We're very grateful to the complainants to come to us. And um, we hope that something useful will come afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Kis Jembinska. And I would like to thank each of you for these contributions. Now is the 
it's time to open the question and answers for part of the members. Uh, the, f the first is for Sophie Veil, our rapporteur of this committee. Yes, I would like to thank our two speakers. I have to say that uh, it, it leaves me uh, deeply depressed or angry or both, I have to say, because it, again, confirms uh, the attitude of the European Commission, uh, which is very technocratic uh, on the one hand and pretending that governments are its only interlocutor, that it has no responsibility for upholding EU values, for actually enforcing the laws and the treaties, uh, but it just pretends that it's all a technocratic exercise. And if this House weren't in such a mess itself at this moment, I would actually want it to, to send the Commission packing. But okay, this is my pre-Christmas uh, rant. Um, we really don't miss an opportunity to mess up, do we? Okay, my question. Um, uh, do, you, do you think after your, your intervention, uh, do you have any indications that the Commission actually got it uh, and that they're going to do it differently? And do you have any indication that the Commission, uh, when, you know, if it gets it, it means that it's going to apply the same logic uh, to other, uh, let's say, policy areas? Because I think they're doing exactly the same with the dual use regulation. You know, verifying whether the export rules are being applied, uh, and, and when it comes to dual use, it's also about human rights. Uh, <laughs> it's, they make it the same tick box exercise. They just ask the governments, you know, are you correctly applying the rules? And then the government says, yeah, yeah, of course we're applying the rules. And then the commission, oh, thank you very much. We'll be back in two years. This is what the commission does. And so is it your... Again. And after two years, they do the same. And then they, they issue a report saying everything's fine, wonderful, hunky-dory. Um, and we know it's not. And I'm very, very grateful for the Ombudsman that you are actually doing what the Commission should be doing. Uh, but is it your impression that they now understand and that they're going to, uh, to, to do what you've recommended and that they actually understood the logic uh, of applying the same uh, or, or, or uh, let's say, approaching these, these matters in the same way also in other policy areas. You can be brutally honest. This is, this is you know, the last Strasbourg, Strasbourg Thursday before Christmas, so please. Well, so I think, unfortunately, um, we cannot be too positive about uh, what could happen. Uh, yeah, we will see what the Commission uh, reply, uh, replies. Um, certainly the reply will be very kind. Uh, but whether there will be some content, I'm not sure. In any way, uh, what, what is the Ombudsman's approach, um, Emir Ali is all very keen to be very practical. We tell them almost with the finger, do this. You know, is it, somehow Ombudsman educates the Commission. And it's very hard to reply to concrete suggestions by saying, we just ignore them. So uh, at least I hope that they will explain in administrative terms what they could do uh, better in the future. About the past, I mean, we had so many investigations uh, on human rights impact assessments and the Commission's uh, reply, as I said, is similar in this case, also in other cases. The first defense is there is no legal obligation to do something, so we don't do it. But this is not uh, good administration. The, the, the diligence uh, was explained on many occasions by the court, uh, in, and the Commission knows that they should do not only what is in the law, but on many occasions they should see holistically many other provisions of law, not only ones which apply directly to the specific case, and take this into account. So, um, and the Commission knows how to do human rights impact assessment, because Digitrade, for instance, issued uh, very good guidelines on this. Um, we had an investigation in 2014 when the Ombudsman looked into European structural funds and uh, Emir Ali uh, told the Commission, you have to uh, take into account the Charter and, um, and help member states with some guidance how they should uh, check the compliance of the use of the funds with the Charter. And the Commission did so. So, I mean, it is possible. But if I say, speak about the investigation from 2014, and the Commission moved it, and it's only a few years later. So now the Ombudsman decided to, on this case in November. Uh, hopefully, the Commission will not take a long time. And also, there are other issues, of course, the, the issue of the development aid, how we perceive it. Um, uh, I mean, 
there are many, many, many issues around. But I, I am not so positive that the Commission will say, thank you very much, Ombudsman, we'll do everything what she wants. No, I'm not so positive. This is my personal approach. Thank you. Let's get the... Uh, yes, okay. thanks. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your interventions uh, to both of you. Um, I have a question to um, uh, Mr. Vaca Villarreal. Um, what is your assessment about the, the, the way we could work together from EU and from uh, Latin America and perspectives? Um, because the EU can regulate, the EU can have its own framework, but uh, we also need to have an uh, international approach on this. Uh, the US has been uh, somehow regulating, but I also hear that yeah, everything is not done on that level to prevent abuses of uh, spyware. Uh, and so what's your insight? Is there any political willingness uh, from um, American perspective to uh, work on a legislative framework, on safeguards, on uh, better regulation, and uh, that we could uh, maybe find common ground to work together? Um, and um, Madam uh, Hirsch, thank you very much also, and I share my colleagues' uh, Consideration, because the Commission is really uh, abusing human rights. Uh, recently, your office, Ombudswomen, uh, addressed also uh, the issue of trade and uh, the, the problematic of the human rights clause that is not enforceable uh, in, in the, the context of our trade relations. We have other uh, uh, cases, and now this one adding a layer to uh, the, the inaction of the European Commission. And so if there's no legal obligation, we should adopt a legal obligation. Uh, that will be uh, part of our recommendations. And you've mentioned it, ex ante impact assessments. It's true for uh, the, 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 um, the Fund for Africa. It's true for trade relations. It's true for many other files uh, where systematic impact assessments uh, should be uh, done including on human rights, not only on human rights, but of course including on, on human rights. Uh, so if we can work together on this, um, it, would be, it would be, yeah, necessary to, to, to do it. Um, do, 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 I'm looking at my um, questions, yes. Do you think, um, we, we haven't talked about specific uh, legislations, but for instance, um, did you dig into the dual use uh, regulation uh, and what could be done there uh, to improve also um, the work uh, that we're doing in our uh, inquiry committee? Uh, do you think it should be revised and, and in which uh, direction in your view? Uh, or is it mainly a lack of implementation of uh, the current uh, legislation in, in place? Um, maybe you can, I don't know if, if your inquiry also digged into that, uh, but that would be um, interesting to, to know your thoughts uh, on that matter. Um, thank you very much. Vamos a pasar primero la palabra al señor Bacabella Real. Puedes... Es tu turno. Puedes coger. ¿Escuchan ahí? Bueno, much muchas gracias por, por la pregunta. A ver, yo creo que hay, hay tres elementos a tener en cuenta acá. El primero, desde el mandato de la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos, estamos monitoreando y tenemos obviamente la expectativa de que haya un esclarecimiento y sanción. Y, eh, y esto corresponde más a los ámbitos de los Estados miembros, ¿no? más que de investigaciones que se realicen al interior de, de, del organismo regional de derechos humanos. Eh, pero creo que hay una serie de barreras, de, de muros muy altos que hay en este desafío que tienen los Estados y uno muy importante tiene que ver con la información. Creo que un primer ámbito que yo sugeriría de eventual eh, digamos, eh, colaboración, eh, in, intercambio entre los sistemas regionales europeos e interamericanos tiene que ver con, por ejemplo, cuáles serían esos estándares mínimos de información que permitirían hacer un seguimiento del de progreso de no solo de, de las investigaciones, sino también de las medidas de no repetición que se puedan estar, estar tomando. Eh, 
Y esto tiene que ver con los controles internos de la operación de estos mecanismos y los controles externos que tiene que tener en un sistema de frenos y contrapesos, eh, eh, como digamos, en términos de, de, de democracia. Después hay un segundo componente que tiene que ver con la adecuación, es decir, tanto a nivel multilateral como bilateral. Existen un amplio margen de, 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 de cooperación entre instituciones europeas y estados al menos de la región. Creo que sería muy importante que en los análisis de adecuación de estos instrumentos no solo se tenga en cuenta que la normativa interna eh, es, es respetuosa a los derechos humanos, sino también ayudar a los propios estados a, mejor, a, 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 a contar con las mejores prácticas en estos temas, porque los, incluso los estados han reconocido públicamente que esto es un desafío de carácter global donde no necesariamente se cuenta con todos los, los, los elementos. Pero después creo que hay un último elemento que tiene que ver con, eh, yo, yo lo llamaría como mm, instancias de, de, de estructurales para poder sortear este desafío. El primero tiene que ver con el Estado de Derecho el Estado de Derecho está eh, en riesgo. Y, por ejemplo, si queremos eh, investigaciones eh, y sanciones para que abusos no se repitan, un elemento muy importante es la independencia judicial. Un elemento muy importante es que las investigaciones cuenten con recursos humanos y financieros suficientes para adelantarse con todas las garantías para todas las partes. Y esto es algo que en, en, en nuestro continente es, es, un, es, un, es una gran conversación, es un, hay una gran discusión alrededor de este tema y creo que Estado de Derecho es un todo eh, eh, muy importante en, en este sentido. Y el segundo tiene que ver también como, con una porción muy importante de las víctimas, una porción muy importante de las víctimas son las y los periodistas. Luego todo trabajo, todo, todo esfuerzo que se emprenda en dirección a fortalecer las condiciones para el trabajo periodístico eh, eh, son, son, son muy importantes. Hay, 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 hay un elemento que, que creo que tiene que ver con, estos, con este aspecto de Estado de Derecho y de, y de periodismo, y es, eh, independientemente de si hay o no, y es algo que se, que se debe esclarecer, participación de agentes estatales, al menos en los casos que nos han sido referidos a, eh, a, a, a la Relatoría de Libertad de Expresión, Sí es importante advertir que el, la, la, las, las víctimas, las, particularmente los, los periodistas, eh, se, estaban, eh, en, digamos, se encontraban adelantando investigaciones que cuestionaban el poder público. Y aquí quiero ser muy claro, la prensa en eh, una democracia es normal, incluso muchas veces es deseable que existan tensiones con las autoridades públicas y es importante que la sociedad pueda conocer y advertir de esas tensiones, de esas controversias, de esos cuestionamientos, eso eh, fortalece los sistemas democráticos. Pero si dentro de esa tensión existe o existiera una intromisión de la naturaleza que permite Pegasus en la vida de, de las y los periodistas, estamos hablando de que esa tensión ya empieza a ser desigual y empieza a tener un nivel de abuso muy superlativo. Aquí no me estoy refiriendo a ningún estado en particular. Quiero decir que es muy importante eh, asegurar que este tipo de tecnologías no se usen para perseguir actividades trascendentales para la vida democrática como es el periodismo, la oposición política, etc. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Well, uh, there are two questions I understand. Human rights impact assessment uh, as an exercise is an administrative exercise. The Commission knows very well how to do it. But um, what, what the Commission tries to do is deviate some, deviate the human rights issue and mix it up with other issues and do a general impact assessment in which human rights would disappear. And this is not good. We, we told the Commission on several occasions, you have to separate this in separate documents. You have to do this, what you know to do human rights impact assessment. And we, when we look at into documents of uh, many, many of these projects um, uh, and surveillance capabilities uh, transfer of um, to, to African countries, it depends actually which delegation was involved. There were some delegations which were quite diligent, you know. So they, they knew how to do this and they did it even they had no instructions to do it. So I would say it is pos possible to do it. The Commission could know how to do it. And whether we need a legislation telling the Commission that, well, we have already the Treaty um, de EU, which uh, clearly says the external action uh, should be guided by uh, 
uh, how it is say, uh, indivisibility of human rights, right, and, and fundamental freedoms, respect for human dignity. Um, so uh, it's enough that the Commission interprets this uh, uh, primary law of the European Union in a proper way, and it's evident that human rights impact assessment should be done. Um, and again, this is administrative exercise, and it's very easy if you do it not as a tick box, uh, you know, exercise, but really you, you assess uh, things uh, in a diligent way on the basis of, uh, of your research information, the Commission has it. Well, the another question was about dual uh, use regulation. Um, if the Ombudsman receives a complaint concerning um, whatever European Union law, unfortunately we cannot deal with it because we cannot deal with merits of the um, of the law, but I could imagine one day maybe we receive a complaint concerning the implementation. Uh, now we, we have an investigation which is still ongoing, so I cannot comment much about this. Um, it was also complained from, um, from the same NGOs uh, which came to us as regards the African Trust, and it concerned European External Action Service and their uh, involvement in, uh, in this uh, transfers of surveillance capacities. And there the element um, which uh, relates to dual use regulation is there, but uh, at this stage, unfortunately, I cannot comment more. Thank you. Thank you. Now I will pass the floor to Thun and Horstenstein. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, um, our guests, um, um, for your presentations. And, um, well, we speak here about countries outside of the European Union. We do not legislate. Uh, if we don't pay, we don't really have influence. But as far as Mexico, I would like to ask a specific question because there was a case of uh, spying, um, legal or illegal, but the current president, I remember, promised to stop this practice and to investigate in the case um, so, that the, so that it stops. Uh, now, I wanted to know, do we, are we assured that it really did stop or are we have the certainty? or do we have um, um, reasons for suspicions um, that this is still ongoing? But um, as far as developing countries are concerned and our aid, um, the fact that uh, the Ombudsman and its uh, office, or her office, um, looks so closely at the human rights and demands uh, proper assessments from the Commission is of utmost importance. But frankly speaking, what I really do not understand, and I wonder if the Ombudsman ever, uh, well, if she can ask about it or if she did ask about it, what does a surveillance system that we apparently provide to those countries have to do with development, with development aid? Why do we provide at all? Is this within the framework of development aid. This is, frankly speaking, um, I know that this is a procedure that has been, I mean, this story has been functioning for a longer time, but still every time I hear that not only that they buy with the money that they receive from us, but that we provide the system, every time I hear this, I am profoundly shocked because to my mind, this has nothing to do with the policy of development aid. Thank you very much. I will pass the floor in the inverse order. Okay. Please take the floor your first. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much for this uh, question. Well, um, we we dealt with a specific complaints, so we could not go much ultra petitum, I would say. We had to deal with the allegations and claims. Even the Ombudsman went a bit farther, as usually she does, and she made a suggestion for improvement. But, but indeed, I mean, uh, from the material we studied for this case, um, it is obvious that as regards European Trust Fund for Africa, this, I, I underline again, it was done in 2015. So it was because of a migration situation, and the European Union mm -hmm. wanted simply to stop migration from these countries. And development aid is about eradication of poverty. It's not about the, um, how to say, uh, managing uh, the, the flux of migration. And they were, we, we, we came across with different material um, issued by different NGOs very active in this field uh, from which it's obvious that the, 
the objective was um, was wrong, and it was again uh, against the, the, the cooperation as existing, giving the developing country um, uh, more agenda, and also even about the uh, the problems created collaterally because when they strengthened the, the border management, the intra migration in the African continent was stopped as well, and this is extremely complicated for economic reasons. So, yeah. Uh, we, we didn't ask the questions about this. Uh, the uh, scope of the investigation was not about this, and it would be difficult to trace it in this way because it would be going rather to policy than the administration matters. But um, as I said, from material we studied, um, yeah, the, the, your, your suspicion is, is, is exactly correct. Yeah. Thank you. Hola. Eh. Muchas, muchas gracias por la pregunta. Creo que hay, hay de, de una parte, yo quisiera compartir un planteamiento y es, si tenemos en cuenta que de acuerdo a la información recibida los, hacia el año 2017, las primeras infecciones habrían sido alrededor del año 2015-2016, por las características de esta misma tecnología y varios aspectos que ya este comité conoce, ¿no? eh, sobre la trazabilidad, etcétera. A esta altura, transcurridos más de cinco años, eh, ya sería muy importante tener avances más significativos. Eh, sobre sobre el, el caso particular de México, justo ahorita estaba chequeando, el, el 8 de noviembre del año 2021, eso ya hace más de un año, eh, la Fiscalía General de la República informó que obtuvo una orden de aprehensión eh, contra una persona por su presunta responsabilidad en, eh, utilizando el software conocido públicamente como Pegasus. Esto es, eh, digamos, eh, un modesto, un muy tímido avance, digamos, para la dimensión de los hechos que, 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 que hemos tenido oportunidad de, sobre los cuales hemos tenido oportunidad de recibir eh, denuncias. Eh, y, y creo que aquí viene de nuevo el componente de cooperación y el componente de información. Eh, cooperación para... Eh, esclarecer e información para que como democracias eh, podamos tomar eh, las mejores decisiones en, eh, de cara a prevenir que estos hechos de abusos se repitan. Es que incluso si quisiéramos, en el ámbito de la, tratando de juntarlo con, con la anterior pregunta, eh, si quisiéramos, por ejemplo, desde los organismos multilaterales, sugerir eh, marcos, digamos, de... Para la, para la prevención y de, y de vida diligencia en la prevención de abusos, se requeriría parte de información para, para poder formularlo. Es decir, hay, hay, eh, sabemos las consecuencias del uso de software, eh, pero no, no sabemos, al menos en, en, en las Américas yo no tengo registro al respecto, de cuál sería esa información mínima eh, que sería suficiente a efectos de tomar medidas de prevención. Eh, y en este sentido, la información eh, eh, en el caso mexicano muchas veces se torna contradictoria. ¿no? De hecho, eh, se nos ha indicado por, por parte de organizaciones de la sociedad civil, por ejemplo, que eh, se hicieron requerimientos de información pública que posteriormente, eh, digamos, a través de unos leaks eh, y, una, y unas filtraciones de información del sector defensa, que fue alrededor del mes de octubre de este año, eh, no se correspondería a la información que habría sido entregada eh, previamente a través de solicitudes de acceso a la información con la que posteriormente se habría dado a conocer en, en, en materia de, de, de estas filtraciones y de estos leaks. Entonces creo que información y cooperación son dos variables muy importantes para, para eh, sortear estos desafíos. ¿Hay alguna otra pregunta? Si no, voy a hacer yo una última, uh, más concretamente al señor Baca Villarreal, pero si tiene alguna información. Y es en relación a… Um, tenemos muy pocos casos, eh, bueno, tenemos muchos casos en Europa que han empezado su curso judicial, pero no tenemos muchos casos que estén realmente investigándose. Eh, ¿Usted conoce en los países que son, nos ha nombrado, en México, en El Salvador, casos concretos de denunciantes de, de las víctimas de Pegasus que hayan avanzado en la justicia y se esté llegando al final de un, de un proceso judicial para 
uh, poder reparar, como muy bien decía, los casos de víctimas. Y en este caso, cómo, cómo se están haciendo, si nos puede pasar los nombres y después nosotros ya miraríamos de estudiar más los casos. Muchas gracias. Eh, conozco, no he tenido la, el, el privilegio de, de eso, el final para encontrar justicia, creo que eh, de, los, de los casos que he podido conocer hay mucha experiencia, hay mucha experiencia, son ya varios años eh, de, de personas buscando justicia y por lo tanto también creo que han, conocen de cerca los obstáculos tanto en términos de información como en términos institucionales que, que, que han enfrentado. Eh, a efectos de, de, digamos, de, 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 de ponerles en contacto, yo digamos, sin ningún problema podría, eh, bajo autorización de, de, de las personas eh, y, y obviamente a través de los canales que disponga el comité, por facilitarlo, yo recomendaría que escucharan a las, a, las, a, la, a las víctimas o por lo menos a sus representantes, creo que esto es una dimensión que que desde ese lugar también puede ser muy útil para, para, para el comité y también compartir que hay preguntas que van más allá del componente judicial o que involucren el componente judicial, pero van más allá. Si estamos hablando, por ejemplo, de que en algunos casos hay extracción de información y esa extracción de información eh, levanta la pregunta de el Estado o los Estados también están en la obligación de ubicar esa información y ¿Qué pasa con esa información después? ¿no? Esa es una información donde ya eh, desde la Relatoría de Libertad de Expresión hemos dicho es muy importante notificar y conocer la, la, la opinión de las víctimas con respecto al futuro de esa información. La sensibilidad de esa información eh, puede variar. Eh, los ámbitos de especial protección del derecho a la intimidad pueden ser mucho más sensibles, por ejemplo, en caso de, de, de mujeres periodistas que no lo han transmitido en, en, en particular. Entonces creo que en este punto... Eh, Tomar contacto con, con, con víctimas y representantes por parte del comité me parecería un, 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 un paso razonable, porque si algo lamentablemente podemos ofrecer desde este rincón del mundo es más años en términos de personas buscando justicia y, eh, y, y ahí hay muchos obstáculos, hay muchos obstáculos que, que muy seguramente eh, distintos actores interesados en que se haya reparaciones a, la, a las víctimas pueden contribuir a que, a que la experiencia internacional en su conjunto mejore. Muchas gracias. Muy bien, pues muchísimas gracias a los invitados, sobre todo en especial al señor Baca Villarreal, que es muy temprano en Washington. Eh, muchísimas gracias por estar hoy con nosotros. Muchas gracias. Uh, y ahora no tenemos ningún otro punto del orden del día. Por lo que el anuncio es que nuestra próxima reunión es el lunes, 9 de enero, en Bruselas. Uh, muchísimas gracias hoy por estar aquí. Bueno, felices vacaciones, uh, felices fiestas y que descansemos mucho después de este año tan duro que hemos tenido para coger con fuerzas este 2023, que será importante para este comité para cerrarlo con, buena, con un buen informe. Muchas gracias a todos. Y, perdonad, muchas gracias a los intérpretes, porque hoy han hecho un gran trabajo hablando todos muy, muy rápido. Felices fiestas también a vosotros. Gracias.